session on citizen comments, and that is uh, citizen comments for anything that's not on, if there's anything that anybody wants to talk about that's not on the agenda for tonight. Uh, and then we'll get to the public hearing uh, about the site plan for the Home Inc, the uh, PUD for uh, Home Inc. Then we'll cover old business, uh, comprehensive land use plan, any new business, uh, agenda planning. Are we going to still have the infrastructure report? Under agenda planning, we'll do it in some other future time. Okay. Yeah. And after that, uh, when we finish everything, then we'll adjourn for the evening. Sure. Right. So uh, let's start with the review of the minutes of, uh, for October 8th, 2018. Does anybody have any corrections? Page one. Page two. Page three, page four, and page five. There's no corrections. Anybody would like to make a motion to approve the minutes for Monday, October 8th? I, I move that we approve the minutes. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Do you want to call the vote on that, please? And you can just do a vo voice well, vote on that. Voice vote. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes for uh, Monday, October 8th, 2018, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Now, uh, for the minutes for the special work session on Thursday, October 18th, 2018. Any corrections or changes? Page one. Page two. Or page three. Would somebody like to make a motion to approve those? Uh, motion to approve. Second. Uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Last well, right. uh, Now we're going to do yes. a special addition to here from the solicitor. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Chris Conard. I'm the village solicitor. Uh, I want to just generally explain the process. This is the first time under the new zoning code that there's been a public hearing pertaining to a request for a rezoning for a, uh, a PUD. Um, so th if you've had an opportunity to, to look at the staff report, you'll note that it's 22 pages long with a, a series of exhibits. It is a uh, complicated process that we're going to go through tonight, so I ask everybody to be patient with that. Um, it will start out with a staff summary. Uh, there will be questions from the commission of the staff. Uh, following that, there will be a public hearing, um, at which point uh, there will be perhaps some questions asked by the commission. The public hearing will be closed, at which time the commission will de uh, deliberate and make a determination. Um, there are, uh, because of uh, a vacancy on uh, the commission, or part of the commission. There are four members present, uh, according to the uh, zoning code uh, 127602E. Three votes are needed uh, to either make a, to approve, to deny, or approve with modifications the application. Um, in addition, uh, the anybody who thinks that they might uh, be speaking or addressing council, we have to go through a process because it's a public hearing where we have to swear in the witnesses. So the easiest way to do that is if you think that you might be speaking or you know you're going to be speaking, I won't make people raise their hand or stand up, but if you would raise your hands, we'll just swear in everybody. Okay. Um, Including planning commission? No, planning commission does not need to. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth as to all matters before this commission? And if the answer is yes, say so. Okay, thank you. Uh, the last thing that we need to put on the record is, is that as part of this process, um, you will hear that there was a work session on October 18th, which is contemplated in the, in the, uh, the zoning code. Um, before that work session, a couple months before that, uh, Home Inc. had a meeting with uh, Rose Pelzel and Frank Doden, who were the chair and vice chair at the time of the Planning Commission, where they presented a very, very general concept. Uh, in the interest of transparency, we wanted to disclose that meeting. There was nothing presented in that meeting that, uh, that it was just a concept. 
nothing written was prepared uh, and everything was addressed in the work session moving forward. Did I summarize that fairly, Frank? Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, I think that uh, the chair has already called the agenda item and uh, that it would be time for Denise to... Oh, oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, no, we received... Uh, uh, for the part of the agenda on communications, we received two letters from, from, from uh, Linda Chernick. Pronounce your name correctly, is Linda here? Uh, and another from Steve Kahn. And both of those letters, as I understand, are part of the official record. Right? Yes. And uh, both of the letters are in opposition uh, to granting the PUD. And uh, they, uh, both of them raised sort of different concerns about it, uh, everything from the, the scale of the building, you know, the size of the building, the use of the land, uh, you know, specifically for senior housing as opposed to uh, you know, affordable, uh, single family dwellings. And uh, let's see, I'm not sure how much, how much detail do I need to go into the letters? Uh, they're, they're publicly available. Okay. You've referenced it for purposes of the record. And uh, if, uh, if either Linda or Steve are here and would like to add anything to the letters that's not already included in the letters, I could give you a minute or two to do that now, but I don't think they're here, is that right? Okay. All right. So, all right, that gets us to the public hearing. Hold on, no. oh, okay. At the public oh, hearing. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Report. Uh, Council is in the midst of uh, reviewing the 2019 budget, which at this point is a deficit budget. So we're taking probably longer than Council usually takes to really dig deep into the budget. And some of the things that are in the budget are capital and infrastructure improvements that staff has been recommending as part of a, I guess maybe like a five-year plan as well as uh, items that council uh, wants to have in according to our goals, one of which is an affordable housing line item, uh, affordable housing fund. Uh, the other thing that happened at the last council meeting was that council uh, approved the goals for our housing plan, which is still being developed. Uh, and uh, the goals are based on the uh, housing needs assessment and the goals recommendations from Patrick Bowen. The goals that council approved are to, uh, what is the word, to support uh, or encourage, encourage the development of 500 housing units over the next 10 to 15 years, divided 60% rental, 40% home ownership. Um, the, the rental uh, proportion would be focused on low and moderate income primarily. That's the population that is most in need of rental. And the home ownership, uh, 200 or so houses for home ownership would be moderate and upper income. And Patrick Bowen had presented a fairly in-depth report to council with particular goals for particular age groups and particular income and family size. And so the goals, we, we, we um, approved a sort of general goals um, based on the more detailed goals that he uh, had uh, given to us or suggested to us, and they will be included in the housing plan. One difference that we did was that the Housing Advisory Board met with some local stakeholders, realtors, housing developers, someone from the schools, from um, the senior center, I think there were about a dozen, and we presented them with Patrick Bowen's suggested goals. This group thought they were too uh, aggressive, both in terms of number and time period. So what we did is we extended, Patrick had said 500 units in five years, which would be 100 housing units a year, and uh, we scaled back. We extended the time and made it. So 
So, and just to be clear, the village government is not in the business of developing houses. We encourage the development. We kind of do things to encourage it. So the next step, then, that the Housing Advisory Board will be doing will be looking at how can that happen? How can we encourage? Um, and we'll continue to be reporting on that. That's it. And Council also passed seven amendments to the Zoning Code as recommended by Planning Commission. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the council report. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, opportunity for citizen comments about anything that's not on the agenda for tonight. Does anybody wish to address the planning commission about anything that's not on the agenda? Okay. Seeing nothing there, we can move on to the public hearing okay. uh, regarding the uh, site plan for uh, Home Inc. PUD Senior House. Okay, um, so uh, as a zoning administrator, um, I reviewed the qualifying conditions and the PUD requirements. Um, and um, the project did present some challenges in meeting the criteria, um, but I'm gonna kind of go through that report and allow Planning Commission an opportunity to um, weigh in on whether this uh, proposal um, re achieves recognizable and substantial benefits to the community um, that would not be possible under the existing zoning classification. Um, an application for rezoning to PUD, you, you're allowed to do a PUD on any, in any, on any land in any district. Um, what happens is whatever that property is zoned, depending on what your use is, um, there is qualify, there's a a there's language within the PUD code that um, tells you what type of um, district you apply to that. So in this case, um, the land is zoned residential B, and it happens to abut residential C to the north, um, but it is surrounded by residential B, even though Friends Care Center is actually not a residential um, per se, it's still in residential B. Um, however, multifamily um, in the PUD is, uh, you use the zoning classification of RC. So that's the high density residential. And in reviewing this, that's what I did was I applied the, the, um, the requirements for residential C. Um, under 1254.03 PUD requirements, um, the lot area and the lot width are met. This is 10 lots. Um, each lot is um, 50 by 150, give or say, um, and uh, the t for a total, which, you know, if this is approved, um, staff will ask, uh, and they will agree, they've already said they offered to, um, was to replat the 10 lots into one. Um, that gives a frontage of 250 feet on both Marshall and Herman Streets. Um, the total acreage, um, and this is staff's calculation is 1.853 based on um, the uh, Green County GIS at this time, pending a survey. Uh, so the setbacks are met. Um, again, the setbacks are for residential C, which are pretty generous. Um, there's two side yards on this, on this uh, development um, and two front yards. Uh, there is no backyard. Um, it's because it would be considered what is called in the um, zoning code of through lot. It basically has frontage on East Herman and frontage on Marshall. Um, the lot coverage requirement is met. Um, the total square feet of the property is 80,750, and the lot coverage allowance is up to um, 40,375 square feet, and the building footprint is 18,901. So the lot coverage requirement was met in that. Um, the maximum density and height for this project um, has raised some concerns. Um, the maximum density for a property of uh, 1.83 um, acres is 28 units. That's 14 units per acre. Um, and we do allow to round up. So if you were at 1.5 or 1.8 as this, you can round up to the next um, 14 units. Um, however, in this design, it's showing 54 units. Um, the height maximum for 
everywhere in residential is um, 35 feet, three stories, and pretty much that's everywhere ex uh, in the village except for in the industrial district. Um, and the design shows 55 feet and four stories. I just want to take a minute to see if Planning Commission has any questions about that. Okay, I'll continue on. Staff reviewed the parking um, and that there um, concern there. There's 54 units. Um, the zoning code requires 1.25 uh, parking spaces per unit, which would be 68 spaces. Um, the design proposes 54 spaces um, with just three um, ADA spaces. Um, and these ADA spaces um, are the general number of spaces that's typical for a parking lot. Um, however, with this being a senior um, d housing development, um, staff does wonder <coughs> if there should maybe be more than three. Um, I'm not quite sure what the apartment building age is for the seniors. I didn't see that, and maybe homie can address that at some point. Is it 55 and older? Okay. Um, so at 55 and older, I, you know, a lot of people are still driving. I know I am. Um, so, uh, and this not being located downtown, so, you know, walk, you need to walk to, to get groceries or go to the pharmacy, you're probably going to need some sort of transportation. Um, so, as again, that, that was a concern. Um, I also um, had a concern with what the impact might be on East Herman and East Marshall Street, um, especially East Herman. There is a, a driveway uh, that will enter the parking lot East Marshall as well as um, East Herman Street. However, on East Herman Street, uh, there's a proposed fire station that, has a, that will have a driveway nearby um, and then you have the Friends Care Center um, property right across the street. Um, in a quick phone call to Friends Care Center they indicated they have approximately 20 to 24 vehicles arriving and departing around 7 a.m. and then again at 7 p.m. Um, the busiest hours for them are on the weekends since visitors are more prevalent and they, they also have probably an increase of another 12 to 15 vehicles on weekends daily at a minimum and there's also a Head Start bus that comes um, daily between uh, 8 and 2.30 and it goes about four times uh, a day on Monday through Friday. So and the reason I bring this up as a concern is it, you know we didn't consider that originally um, as to whether there might need to be um, possibly a turn lane so that could require some sort of improvement to the street. Um, so staff is suggesting that there be some sort of a traffic study done. Um, for the next one, connectivity, the design shows a bicycle walking path on the east side of the property and of the building and, and the walkway will connect uh, to the west side as well. So there actually is going to be like a, a loop for people to walk around the building and um, it also, they also are going to have uh, new sidewalks on both East Marshall and East Hermit Street. So there is that con connectivity. Um, they are also proposing a crosswalk on East Herman um, that will connect to the Friends Care Center but again I think the traffic study is going to have to be an indicator as to whether that would be a good idea or not and then um, we would also need to check with Public Works department to see um, about what that would entail. Uh, there's also, as I mentioned before, the fire station driveway. So and getting into the next one uh, is modification of minimum requirements. There is eight criteria uh, of which four needs to be met and the applicant did address four of the criteria. And I'm only going to review the criteria that they actually um, uh, applied. Uh, number, number two of the criteria, create, improve, or maintain open space for the residents, employees, and visitors beyond the minimum required. <clears throat> uh, staff believes that criteria has been met. Um, have, they've 
have indicated they intend to create open space for residents and visitors that will exceed what's required. Um, as I mentioned, the site plan shows landscape um, areas on the north and south sides of the building with that pedestrian walkway and bicycle path. There's also a pollinator path and an area for resident gardens on the east side. Um, and the open space area exceeds the minimum requirements of 15% with 34% open space. Uh, they applied for number three, commit at least 10% of all dwelling units be affordable. They're going to have 100% of the units being affordable, so they meet that criteria. The next two criteria, um, staff can evaluate that and would like Planning Commission's in input in making the decision if they feel that these two criteria are met. Um, number five was employ low impact design and or other best practices to manage stormwater and reduce the off-site impacts of runoff. Um, they did provide some additional information regarding the stormwater detention basin, which we added uh, to the packet. The, um, I will say that typically, and this would be a requirement in the final uh, review, that staff would have um, an engineer that would be hired to take the stormwater calculations, an independent um, review of the stormwater calcul calculations by the architect to make sure that the stormwater size is going to be sufficient. However, this is the pre preliminary, so that hasn't been done yet. Um, and as well as number six, employ practices and site layout, building construction and materials that are going to result in a measurable reduction in energy consumption. Again, uh, they have provided some additional information um, regarding the uh, energy efficiency of the building, uh, specific design strategies, which is in Exhibit G. But again, I, um, I'm asking for uh, Planning Commission's input in evaluating whether that criteria is met. Do you want me to continue on, or do you want to go ahead and talk about those sections, or? Well, my sense of it is that we should hear from, I mean, you should complete your staff okay. report based on um, what it is. We should hear from the applicant. We should hear from the public. And then my recommendation would be that we, as a board, go through the qualification statements with a little preliminary of what the intent is and what our roles are okay to Makes sense. sum it all up okay the next one is a uh, density bonus um, for consideration of a density bonus the applicant needs to demonstrate that three of the following amenities will be included in the development um, the applicant addressed six of the nine um, <clears throat> and um, I'll review those six more than 20% will be committed as permanently affordable. We've already said that staff agrees with that. Um, the next one would be cool roof technology. Um, staff would like Planning Commission's input on that. One or more of the buildings within the PUD will be LEED certified buildings. Um, this building is, is not LEED certified. However, they're using a different type of compliance, and I did check with Ted being an architect um, who stated that in, at the time that we did the zoning code lead criteria was the only thing that was really um, available and now they've come up with other ways to evaluate and he sees no reason why we would not accept the green uh, enterprise standard. But again, I would want Planning Commission's input on that. Um, low impact uh, development design principles will be employed to minimize stormwater run, runoff. Again, staff um, would like input on that. I've provided all of the information from the architect. The site plan uh, does show that the catch basin locations on both the north and south sides of the property that will flow into the stormwater detention basin. Um, and uh, you can see that on the site plan. Uh, then. I mean, ultimately, in our zoning code under site, site plan review standards, it basically says that stormwater detention and drainage systems shall be designed so that the removal of surface waters will not adversely affect neighboring properties. 
So ultimately, it's, you know, if there, I think there's like a year after that, if there's a problem, they'll have to come back and correct it. Um, number eight was uh, additional accommodation beyond the required pathways will be made for bicycles and pedestrians. Um, I did not feel that that criteria had been met because the addition of the pedestrian walkway Oh, I did say that. Yeah, I did feel it was met because of the addition of the pedestrian walkway and bicycle path on the east side of the building. And they also are going to have a location uh, for the storage of bicycles. Um, a minimum of 25% open space will be dedicated within the development, and I felt that criteria was also met. Um, open space is calculated a little bit differently than lot coverage, um, so not included in this was the um, required setbacks. We did not include the driveway entrances or the um, parking area. The stormwater detention area was not included, and, and yet they still managed to meet that threshold of 25%. For 1254.02 qualifying conditions, um, in order to qualify, for PUD approval, you have to satisfy the conditions of 1254.02, and the first is recognizable benefit. Um, the project has to needs to achieve a recognizable and substantial benefit, not possible, which I mentioned earlier, under the existing zoning classification. Um, out of eight listed, three benefits need to be provided. The applicant shows five benefits, um, and of those five, staff um, has agreed with two of those. Um, number two, um, they um, used a complementary mix of land uses or housing types, but that's meant, I think there was just a misinterpretation, that's meant to be within the PUD itself, not what's around you. So the only, um, it's just, it's going to be a multifamily building, it's not, it's not going to have other types of uh, uses or housing types within the PUD. Um, number three, extensive open space and recreational amenities, agreed with that. It does meet the 15% minimum and the 25% uh, for the density bonus. Connectivity, um, staff thought that although the project has walkways that connect to sidewalks, um, it doesn't consider the walkways within Friends Care Center as greenways or trail quarters. However, later on we're going to hear from um, Home Inc. as they have some updated information about that. Um, typically, these are public spaces um, when you talk greenways or trail corridors, such as like a bike path or local park. So, um, although I'm saying that I didn't agree with it, there may be some more information that will shed light on that may change Planning Commission's uh, thoughts on that. Uh, coordinated development of multiple small parcels, definitely they're taking 10 parcels and going to use them in as into one. <clears throat> and the last one, removal or renovation of blighted building sites or contamination cleanup. Um, by definition, um, this if is not a blighted site. Um, there isn't any building, the building that was there that exists had already been torn down a decade ago. There is some remaining uh, concrete on the property, but there is also not any contamination cleanup. So moving on, size. Uh, council already addressed the size at their last meeting um, by allowing Planning Commission tonight to consider the application. Um, and I meant to mention the, the issues that staff has concerns with is density, height, the parking, and traffic um, based on the size of the proposed development on 1.8 acres. Um, utilities, um, staff provided an updated Exhibit D in the packet um, since the work session. Uh, the Public Works Director is here tonight uh, for any questions the Planning Commission may have regarding utilities. Um, I already mentioned that about the stormwater runoff. And then um, ownership, uh, Home Inc. is the owner of the property. What We'll need is more documentation um, to show that one entity has proprietary responsibility for the full completion of the project um, and information needed including any agreements, 
contracts, covenants, and or deed restrictions indicating that the development will be completed in its entirety as it has been agreed upon. We, we will need that information is needed. Uh, comprehensive plan and vision. I found several quotes within the comprehensive plan and vision, um, making provisions for a range of housing opportunities, costs, and choices that provide safe quality housing for current and potential residents of all income levels. The vision plan states stewardship of land resources that maintain scale and distinct character, puts a pr pr priority on intensification of infill development and redevelopment, and identifies priority growth areas and supports additional green space and farmland. Also, um, redevelopment and infill locations are favored over development of greenfield locations. That was also in the vision statement. For pedestrian accommodation, um, in your packet, Exhibit B1 again shows all those uh, walking paths, bikeways, and the bicycle parking area. Architecture, uh, 55 feet. Um, this building is going to be the tallest uh, non-exempt structure in the village. When I say non-exempt, the zoning code considers public buildings such as um, schools, uh, hospitals, churches, and uh, like government buildings, non-exempt. Um, when I looked at the uh, scale that ATA um, architects provided, it looks like the Antioch, <coughs> Antioch College's North Hall is just a little bit taller. Um, the only other structures in the community that I could think of offhand were um, like the water tower, the cell tower out back, that, um, and possibly the, north, the spirals on Blair Hall might be a little bit taller, but this is going to be pretty, pretty tall. Um, traffic, um, again, just kind of, the one thing about this code is that sometimes it asks the question in different places, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but it's like it depends on what section I'm in, it's, it's, I'm reviewing the same thing again. But on traffic, again, um, can't evaluate the impact because uh, without that traffic study, simply because all of the res we, we have to take into consider the residential traffic, the proposed location of the new fire station's driveway, the um, apartment building the f itself, 54 units, um, and Friends Care Center. We need to look at that because it could require widening of the street or some other traffic safety or mitigation design. And that's, that pretty much summarizes qualifying conditions and uh, the PUD requirements. So, takes us to the review standards, but Ted, you made a suggestion that um, well, I think that in order for us to go through the process of the fact that this is a variance and that the variance is a legal issue for this board, unlike typical things that we see across this board, um, we need to go through, uh, after we hear from the applicant and the public, we have to go through each one of those qualifying statements and make a statement to that effect as well. And that gives Judy something that she can log. It's something that council then can see. Um, it's something that the public sees that we've done our due diligence. And I think it's really, really important to stay on point to those issues because um, planning commission's role is very, very distinct from council. Um, our role on planning commission is to see how each one of these qualifying statements is either met or not met based on the application. It's not to get into a lot of judgment about uh, whether or not this is an appropriate project. This is strictly our board is to look at it based and compare it to the zoning code, period. So we can't get into a lot of other issues. Uh, that is the role of village council, and that's where it goes from here. So. Our job is to simply do that comparison. Um, and I think it's really, really important to stay on point so that we're concise 
about that process. Yeah. Um, to your point. So they have asked for several variances. Um, I would assume we would either grant or not grant the variance if we feel there's a substantial reason to do that, but it's a variance based We're on a recommendation to grant the variance. If, if based I can interject for just a, for a second. Technically, under the language of the code, it's the, the, the precise word is deviation, mm -hmm. not variance, for purposes of the PUD, and that's found in Section 1254.03D. That's um, entitled Modification of Minimum Requirements, uh, which the applicant for a PUD shall identify in writing all intended deviations from the zoning requirement. So, for purposes of this hearing, and that's a term of art. The other thing I would add is that. Later in the chapter, it contemplates that there can be conditions placed, but that's different than deviations from the code itself. specify any particular topics that we'd like Homi to especially address? I think that it would be beneficial for the um, for the applicant to give a brief overview of their application, basically. Um, we all know what the deviations are. Um, I think Denise explained those very well. Um, I think then that we should hear from the public to add comments that none of us have heard yet um, simply because it hasn't been a public process yet. Um, and at the end of that, then um, we keep the applicant on task uh, to help us through the qualification list and clarify anything that we might bring up once we get into the minutiae of each one of those qualifying things. Yeah, um, so I would like the applicant to uh, briefly discuss the eight criteria, in particular ones where there might be a question, uh, a, a different interpretation than uh, our yeah. zoning. Yeah, and so with the connectivity, they had some new information yeah. on that. And, and then also to discuss the uh, deviations that they're requiring, why that those are reasonable and would meet our standards. A motion to open the public hearings. You have the power. I just can open the public hearing. <laughs> well, in that case, I will open the public hearing. Uh, and we'll start uh, if uh, the applicant can come forward and please introduce yourself. State your name for the record, please. Sure, I'm Emily Seibel. I'm the executive director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. And it feels so good to finally be at this point. Um, because as many people here know, um, we've been working on this project for more than 10 years. So this feels um, pretty significant to finally be at the point where we're bringing it forward to council. And I'm here with our development team. Some members of the Home Inc. staff are here. Chris Hall, our program manager. Uh, Kanata Sanford, our AmeriCorps VISTA. Brittany Parsons Keller, our development coordinator and zoning code um, <laughs> guru at our office. And then we also have Wes Young um, from St. Mary Development Corporation, who are our development partners for this project, as well as John Hawes, who is the um, property director, director of property. Um, and then also Rob Hummison uh, with ATA Architects. So um, we do have some visuals that we can put up. I think, why don't you do that? Um, one of the things we heard was that uh, concern over the massing being a flat white building. 
Um, and so we put a little color on it just to give an example of, of how it might look with some, some scale. This is not a final artist rendering. Um, so I'm the executive director of Yellow Springs Home Inc. We're a nonprofit um, organization based in Yellow Springs and our mission is to strengthen community and diversity in Yellow Springs and Miami Township by providing permanently affordable and sustainable housing through our community land trust. We have been listening to seniors in our community for many years about the extraordinary need for this project. We've listened through focus groups, through outreach meetings, public forums, surveys, 16 listening sessions with stakeholder groups this summer, a grassroots senior housing working group, our own interest list of more than 100 households for a similar project now under construction, but that's only six units. Um, and the recent housing needs assessment, which shows a uh, local need for this project and uh, an active market demand to construct at least 180 units of affordable rentals. Seniors in Yellow Springs have very few choices. There is uh, very little freedom of movement here. There isn't a lot of housing stock, especially when you're talking about something that is accessible. Um, period, regardless of your income, and then I think it's even more challenging if you're on a fixed income or low income. Um, there are over a thousand senior heads of household in Yellow Springs today, and um, for those of you who are here to speak today, we do want to thank you because it takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to speak to the need directly. Um, we have found that many seniors are quietly struggling on fixed incomes and have to age in place with growing challenges, including isolation, affordability, and accessibility, while others simply move away. Our dream is to provide quality housing for the elders in our community who have given so much to our village and who have so much still to contribute. So to the seniors of Yellow Springs, we see you and we hear you and we hope to serve you through this project. While at the same time, this project is a vehicle for economic development and meets um, some of the village housing values, I mean housing goals, the village goals, comprehensive land use plan goals, um, and village council values. It also improve, is going to improve the local tax base, turning an infill vacant property that's generated no property tax income for over a decade, um, to generating at least $45,000 a year in property tax revenue um, to support the schools, maybe even more than that. That's a conservative estimate. Um, and it also will create more freedom of movement for seniors to downsize. Many people will qualify um, from an income perspective for this project. And you can see more, um, we speak I think to a lot of different topics in the supplemental documentation that's part of the 103 page packet. So if anybody didn't get a chance to read everything, um, feel free to reach out to us and we will try to connect you with the information. Um, so we, I did wanna say just because this is the first time St. Mary Development Corporation has been in this setting, um, that we have a really incredible development team and we chose St. Mary Development Corporation as partners through a vetting process because of their demonstrated integrity, their nonprofit status, uh, their nearby proximity headquartered in Dayton, their professionalism, their flexibility and open-mindedness, they're willing to um, teach us a lot through this project and treating us as true partners, and their experience and capacity. They've created over 4,000 units of affordable housing through 60 projects. Um, and they have a strong track record of service to seniors and they're known in the industry as setting the benchmark for putting clients first and going way above and beyond with service coordination. Um, in terms of the specific questions that were raised for variances with regards to height and density, um, I did want to say that there are some reasons why the project is 54 units. The first reason is that in order for the project to get funding, and, and we're going to need to bring millions of dollars of outside investment into Yellow Springs to make this project possible, um, we have to balance scoring competitively, which means meeting critical tiebreakers associated with the number of units, while not exceeding the maximum award amount available through the highly competitive non-urban pool of low-income housing tax credits through the Ohio Housing Finance Agency. 
Um, so we have to have a perfect score going in, which we think we can do because this is an awesome site for this project. Um, and then we have to meet the tiebreakers. In this pool, only one of three projects get funded and most of the projects that go in have perfect scores. Um, the second reason that it's 54 units is because we want to go big. <laughs> the need is here in Yellow Springs today. There's pent up demand for this project. The need has been here and it's not gonna get less. Um, we feel that we only have one shot at getting this type of funding. Um, you know, if we get this, we're not gonna be able to go to back and get another one for probably a decade or more. Um, so this is it. We wanted, we wanted to go for it um, and make a lasting difference to provide much needed affordable, accessible, and community oriented housing for our elders. So I think I'm hoping that that addresses the, the two variances. The, the variance on parking, we actually met the criteria and then revised the final submission based on planning commission feedback from the working session. No, you, it was 68, um, you, you just, no. You, it was 68 was the requirement. Um, you presented 54 equal one to one. But then one of the planning commission members did say, based on you, your data showing you don't even need that much right. to an alternate plan, so. Yes, and we, yes, yeah. and that's, that's right, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and that, I think Wes Young can probably speak more to, to the traffic impact, and I'll give him a chance to talk about that um, in just a little bit. The, I, I believe from my, um, my understanding of your report, Denise, that the, the only section that where we didn't meet all the requirements, f um, aside from the variance or deviation requests, was the qualifying conditions. And we, do, we did want to um, say that we have um, in writing an email from Mike, Mike Montgomery, the Executive Director of Friends Care, that that uh, just to clarify concerning our walking path, it is open to all of the public. Um, and so the, the site was designed specifically to create a pedestrian connection to that trail because it's an accessible walking path that we think would really benefit the residents. Um, he also went on to say that if you go to the Friends Care website, it's published as a community amenity. Um, and it's a beautiful trail. I don't know if you've been down it. I have been many times. Uh, but it goes through the woods and around a pond. Um, and so we would hope to qualify for the pedestrian connectivity point, bringing us up to three, um, so that we would be meeting um, the qualifying conditions in addition to the density bonus and the modification of minimum requirements. Um, so Wes, would you like to speak a little bit to the traffic? Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. We appreciate the interest. Um, and if you, you can reintroduce your oh, yourself whenever you come That's right. Come up. I've got that. I'm so getting into this. <laughs> it's uh, Wes Young from St. Mary Development, and uh, I'm Vice President in Charge of Development at, at St. Mary. And uh, probably the best way to describe the, the traffic situation as we see it, and we understand about studies and so forth, is our, our uh, one of our newest projects is called Lions Place 2 on the VA campus in Dayton. It's 55 units and it's a uh, senior. And uh, I think, John, we have a 55, 59 units, right? We had 59 units according to the city of Dayton's rules, four for the staff and 55 for our, our residents. And- uh, Parking spaces. Yeah, parking spaces. So if you go out there, um, my, and this is not scientific, but I would say that about 40 to 50 percent of the spaces are used mo most of the time. Now, the, the thing that one of the reasons the contributing factors of that is that RTA has a really great bus stop, just like Green Cats would have near our near this project, and a lot of the seniors use Green or use the RTA for uh, for transportation. And you guys in Green County have an awesome Green Cats is awesome out here. We really. We have another, we had another project over in Xenia that uh, our residents used over there. So that's what we're going by for the moment. And I believe we have, uh, how, do, how many units did we uh, say we could add if necessary to the parking, five or six, right? 
Okay, Rob. Okay. So, in in if if the 42 or 43, whatever the percentage is, 75 percent. If that didn't work out, we do have more space, even in, in still maintaining our green uh, space and free open space, we could still meet that requirement and add some more spaces if we had to down the road. We'd be glad to do that. It's not that it's not that costly to do it. And so that's what we're basing our, our request on. Uh, we do respect your uh, request for a traffic study, which we can uh, you know we can take take a look at that, and that only I, I think that will will support, you know, our anecdotal um, thoughts at this, at this time, so. Yeah. Glad to answer any questions. Planning Commission, do you want a total as to how many parking spaces they could provide? Sure. I'm sorry, Joe. Uh, how many parking spaces could you provide? We could provide the 54. Oh, but that is what you have listed, isn't it, 54? Well, we, at, at the planning, the, the working session, uh, was suggested that we might be able to go down to 0 0.75 to 1 ratio, which I think is 42. So I think 42 is probably, if you have a, a most recent site plan that you're looking at, it's showing 42, but I think it also shows potential future parking if necessary. Is that? Oh, yeah, the visual. Now, this is, this isn't, you can tell this isn't plans or staged. This is, <laughs> Rob just happens to have this. So, Rob, why don't you show? This is showing the 42 spaces, and there's actually stashed in here, here, and a couple here showing where the additional ones could be added to get back to the 54. I think that was an exhibit that was provided in your application. What, what's the exhibit number, please? Um, I mean, it looks to me like it might be B1. No, I'll see. It was later. It was a parallel. While they're looking it up, the other thing. Right, I, right. B1. Okay, it's right there. Oh, yeah. This, this, yeah, this is actually the wrong one. It's not there's, B1. A, there's a different one. Okay. I've got another this is one. This part of the supplemental packet. I've got it as exhibit oh. I. Yeah. Okay. Is that that's A-001 at the bottom? Yes. yes. Okay, that's, that's exhibit it. I. And Could I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So um, you are still wanting a request for deviation from the village yes. number of parking spaces. Yes. And that, that does add to the competitiveness with the costs. That's, no, I just you know, we don't make the rules, but that's. Clarify that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's how it is. The other, the, the other thing that is w with a senior building, um, the, car, the number of cars is certainly something you, you focus on, but also it's a little different than what uh, the employees of Friends Care, what they experience at 7 in the morning and 7 in the evening when they have shift change, where you have employees coming and going. With seniors, it's a little more throughout the day. It, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, 24% of seniors are using their cars between 11:30 and 1:30. I'm not going to. No, I'm not going to say that. But there is more of a spreading out of usage during the day. Uh, typically, is what we see. Yeah, and for any of the projects, the 60 projects that St. Mary's has been involved, has there ever been a traffic study, traffic mm -hmm. flow study done? Do you remember the last one? That, we haven't. Okay. We haven't had one. No. Well, it was a noise study. That's right. Yeah, a noise study. So. Yeah, we, um, I mean, we, you know, we would obviously prefer not to do one, <laughs> but we, uh, you know, we, we respect your request, so. Yeah. Do you want to, oh. We know who you are. I just, um, in my enthusiasm, I realized I didn't address everything, so now that I have my wits collected. Um, so in terms of height, a good way to visualize the height of this building, which is four stories, and we did check with um, the Miami Township Fire Rescue. I believe the height limitation in the code was really based off coming from fire safety, um, that there 
that this building would meet um, all of the fire safety requirements and it's been signed off on. Um, but the, so we conducted 16 listening sessions over the summer um, with next door neighbors sitting in their living rooms with um, Friends Care Center with a number of different stakeholders um, that we felt it was important to hear from to construct how the building would look. And one of the questions we asked everybody was, would you prefer a three-story building uh, with less green space or a four-story building with maximum green space given uh, the number of units we need and the size of the site, those are the options. Mm -hmm. And um, while it wasn't 100% consensus, we heard uh, many people say they would prefer a four-story building with more green space. And especially important to us was the next door neighbors. And we really did take their input into consideration. So um, allowing us having a four-story four building allows us to more than um, double the amount of open space that is required. Um, in the section also allows us to pull the building back from the next door neighbors a little bit. Um, the other thing we heard is to break up the box, not have an institutional feeling and have step downs and some sort of structural transition to the um, next door neighbors. And so I think we have achieved that. This is just one, one um, angle of the building, but if you look at all of them, you can really see that in some spots, this building is only one story some two and some three and a, uh, one section four. Um, and a good way to visualize the height is that the roof line at the edge of the building on the four-story section is the same height as the top of the Mills Park Hotel. So you can kind of get a sense of it's 44 feet is the roof, the roof line, the roof peak is higher than that. Um, in terms of the modification of minimum requirements and density bonus items, um, starting with modification of minimum requirements, um, employing low impact offsite stormwater and measurable reduction in energy consumption. Uh, I really think that our architect could speak to those points better than I could. And we also included uh, some narratives in the supplemental information, I think that explain our, our positions on those two issues. Um, so I'm going to invite Rob up, and then Rob, while you're up, <laughs> there's also some questions about cool roof technology, um, enterprise versus LEED certification, and the low impact design. So we would like to speak to those five topics. I can, I'll leave this. <laughs> so you can. Hi, I'm, I'm Rob Humson. I'm with ATA Bauhartz Architects. Um, let me talk about the energy efficiency and, and address the LEED and green communities issue. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of work with sustainable architecture as, our, as a firm, and one of the things we do is to um, really tie the correct type of certification to the correct type of project. Um, we do a lot of LEED certified buildings, and we do a lot of green communities buildings. Um, one of the things about green communities is it's targeted specifically to a multifamily project. So. Um, there's things about it that are that are tied um, directly to creating a, a sustainable and an, and an energy efficient uh, project for a multifamily building versus LEED, which um, takes a broader approach to, to buildings that tries to encompass a lot of different types of buildings, whether it's a bank or a warehouse or a, or a thing. And, and LEED has split those types of things up a little bit, but really the the green communities is really more appropriate for this type of project than lead so that's why we've chosen to use it now it's it's certainly not easier um, there's a uh, it actually brings in a few things that tie to um, the the way a property is used that are a little more difficult to attain and one of them has to do with um, really sealing the apartments part of this process is um, we have to kind of super seal everything. Uh, you, you have a lot of details which have extra caulking and, and uh, insulation and things to try to get around all those little areas where, you're, where your air leaks out. And as a matter of fact, part of the certification process is what they call a door test where we bring in a big fan and seal up the door and, and uh, measure whether the air is leaking out of the, uh, the unit. So um, 
I really think it's more appropriate for this, and that's why we're using it instead of lead, um, and would would rather do it than lead. Um, uh, as far as energy consumption goes, um, we've we've taken um, there's a few little techniques that we do. Um, we, we obviously have insulated these quite a bit. Uh, we, we install the insulation on the outside of the studs, which dramatically increases the R value. Um, we use efficient uh, HVAC units. So generally, your energy costs are very, very low uh, compared to, say, a single family home that somebody might be moving out of. Um, it's kind of the, the best techniques. Um, what else was I going on? Water. Uh, storm water. Okay. Um, we, we, of course, are early in the process, so we haven't run the actual storm water calculations. But let me explain how the, the system will be designed. And the primary goal of this is to capture and, and detain and then slowly release all of the water that hits all the hard surfaces. So all of your pavement, all of your roof, everything like that, all of that water instead of right now all that water that hits this pavement for instance just flows right into the uh, off the site and and um, I haven't witnessed it but I've heard that there's there's a problem in this area specifically with that just overwhelming those those ditches and you get get standing water etc so the way this system's designed is there's some catch bases in the um, parking lot there's downspouts all of that stuff ties into some pipes that go over to the stormwater detention basin. This is really a depression. It'll have some landscaping in it that's hardy plants that are appropriate to this. But in a heavy rain event, what will happen is all that water gets and it makes its way to this pond. And instead of just immediately going into the storm system, which are the, the ditches there, uh, it'll be released very slowly. We'll do that with some uh, uh, restricted orifice piping and some things like that that'll let this stormwater release slowly over time. So instead of having all that water hit all at once, it, it releases uh, slowly. Um, okay, um, cool roofs, we actually are very compliant with that. That's one of the, the uh, um, criteria in the green communities is that we, and, and I apologize, I don't have the exact SRI, but um, what they do is they measure the reflectance of the, um, um, the roof in order to keep it from absorbing heat. And in general, you see more white roofs and, and that type of thing. This will have a shingle on it that will have some color to it, but the, uh, it's, it's certified by the manufacturer to have a very specific uh, SRI and the, the requirements of the green communities. Um, is pretty stringent on that. So, for instance, a, a black roof or a brown roof or something like that won't apply. This will this will tend to be a fairly light colored. It, it won't be white, white, but um, depending on what the building colors end up as, it'll be something fairly fairly light, and it, it'll be a considered an actual cool, uh, cool roof. Um, Um, again, the, the low impact um, part of the part of the des uh, the construction process, um, similar to what LEED does, um, requires a lot of the construction techniques um, to be low impact. That means when, um, for instance, uh, instead of a big dumpster on site where all the all the trash gets thrown in, taken to the to the uh, dump, um, there'll be I think four that will separate all different materials. So, you know, scrap metal will go, go get recycled. Um, the, uh, the different pieces will go to different places and most of it gets recycled. It, uh, very little of the actual waste ends up in the, in the, uh, um, the landfill. And um, there's also a high content of recycled materials that go into the building, and again, that's part of the green community's uh, criteria. Okay. You answer any questions? I feel like we've talked enough. Unless there are specific questions, um, I will refrain from saying anything else. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> at this time. <laughs> okay. Shall I just start at the top of the list? Uh, I think we're going to ask, because there's so many people that uh, have signed up to speak, we're going to ask people to try to limit your comments to three minutes. Uh, you'll have a timer down here. You can snarl at people if they go over the time limit. Is that right? Uh, so uh, first person I have on the uh, and please forgive me if I mispronounce your name, Antonia, is it Dosik? And come up and please state your name for the record. And then just address us if you please. Thank you. My name is Tony Dosick. I've lived in Yellow Springs for almost 26 years, a relative newcomer. Uh, I am here tonight to speak in favor of the efforts of Home Inc. to build 54 units of housing on the former clinic site across the street from Friends Care. I was on the board of directors of Friends Care when we looked long and hard at building housing for seniors on the property that now houses the hotel. We ultimately decided against it because after listening to the staff of Friends Care, there were concerns that the property was too far from the Friends Care Center to provide the possible oversight that the staff thought was important. This clearly will not be an issue with this project as it is located directly across the street from Friends Care, just in case somebody needs some help. And of course, the fire department and emergency services are also right there. I also support the project because it is being built by Home Inc., one of the most successful nonprofit organizations in the Miami Valley. <coughs> As the former executive director of three nonprofits and a consultant to others, I am very impressed by how Home Inc. has carefully and successfully built more than 25 units of, affo <coughs> of affordable housing in this village. They have been able to leverage public and private funds, build partnerships with other successful nonprofits like St. Mary's Development Corporation in Dayton, and have built homes for families and individuals who are making a positive contribution to the life of our village. I heartily support this effort. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, next, uh, Suzanne Patterson. My name is Suzanne Patterson, and I'll be 80 years this next coming um, year. I have lived here since 1972. I, I am retired. I have downsized. I want to live in a safe place, no flights of stairs, and with others like myself. Seniors play an important role in this community. This Home Inc. project is greatly needed. I hope that you will resolve all the deviations and, <laughs> and, and, and finally give us this, this great asset to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Karen Wolford. Good evening, Karen Wolford. I'm the executive director of the Yellow Springs Senior Center. And I've listened to your comments tonight about transportation. And I did want to mention that we have a transportation program at the Senior Center. <laughs> so if the seniors in the senior housing development need transportation, we can get them to and from. We do very well with 650 members of the Senior Center with only two dedicated parking spaces in our building. Um, <laughs> I want another deviation. So there should be another deviation. Uh, but anyway, um, everyone has talked about the isolation of seniors. It is something that is uh, very important uh, for seniors to not have that isolation. This sort of project gives them the opportunity to be together, to learn from one another, to share their experiences, 
and it's a critical component. I think also is the entrance and exit of homes, the universal design, making them make sure that they are friendly for those that may have a may have an issue, a medical issue that will necessitate a wheelchair or a walker. A lot of places are not able to do that. This particular project gives us that ability, gives seniors that option to thrive where they want to be, to age in place, and to be where they want to be in their community. Thanks so much. Thank you, Karen. Um, Kennedy Sanford. Hi, my name is Kanata Sanford and I'm reading a letter from my parents. Um, Dear Village Planning Commission, we are excited about the upcoming senior project um, from Home Inc. Between the two of us, Cindy Sanford at the Yellow Springs Credit Union for about 15 years and Greg Sanford at Vernay for 25 years, we have made many friends and built many relationships in Yellow Springs. We may not have lived here, but we have been a part of this community for a long time. We would have loved to live here while we worked here, but the prices were out of reach for us even then. We've always loved Yellow Springs because of its walkability, green space, and overall sense of community that has been here. As we age, we want to be able to live in a place where we can walk to the amenities that we need, not only to cut down our emissions, but to also stay in good health. The senior <coughs> apartment building would be perfect for exactly that. Even though we have lived in Xenia for decades, we have many ties here in Yellow Springs. Our youngest daughter and her family decided to move back to the Dayton area, and they chose to live here in Yellow Springs. It would be perfect to be able to afford to live here to be closer to her and our granddaughter, who is elementary school aged. We have seen families over the decades who have had to leave Yellow Springs because of the rising costs of living in the village. This project will help transition people who are on fixed incomes from being priced out of the place that they have called home for years. This is also an opportunity for people like us who have a deep connection and support the values of Yellow Springs to be able to live here. We hope you consider the positive outcomes that will come out of this project for families like ours. Thank you, Greg and Cindy Sanford. Thank you. Chris? Bongiorno. Thank you for the assist. Uh, Chris Bongiorno. I'm the uh, board president at Home Inc. And I am also an adjacent property owner. I live across the street on Marshall Street. Um, and I am not going to reiterate everything that's already been said by everybody else. And, and I really appreciate everybody's time. Um, so I will just say that my experience, both as a board member um, and as a, an adjacent property owner, has been that this team, both the Home Inc. Uh, staff um, and the, the development partners from St. Mary's and the architects um, have been very conscientious about, about building the partnership and the capacity needed to build this project. Um, responding both to the need in the community as well as to the needs of the different funding sources that we're looking at, um, while at the same time spending time and attention with the neighboring property owners. And I got to witness that firsthand, and I also got to accompany uh, the team as we met with uh, several of my other neighbors. And so the listening was there. The response is clear in the design that I see here. Um, you know, from the original uh, massings and site plans to where we are now, I think there's just a tremendous amount of response to the concerns that the adjacent neighbors had. So um, I'm obviously in favor of the project, and I thank everyone for their time. Thank you. Uh, Cindy Kaufman. Hi, I'm Cindy Kaufman, and um, Emily said speak from the heart. <laughs> so I will do just that. Uh, thank you very much for, um, for honoring everyone's uh, um, talk. I um, moved here 21 years ago. I announced to my family, I feel led to move to Yellow Springs. And I found out all my sons who are now in their 40s, they had already been here, done that, <laughs> hanging out here. So I am now aging. And on behalf of not just myself, but just the hope of so many other seniors who um, would benefit from this project. And again, hats off to Home Inc. because the services that they are providing uh, is just, uh, just more than awesome. And I thank you very much for your time. So thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Linda Parsons. Okay. Uh, Joan Horn. Linda had a meeting she had to go to, okay. so I think she left early. 
I am here to, my name is Joan Horn, and um, I speak from the heart tonight. People have been saying many things that I have agreed with and backed up my gut feeling about the rightness of this project. I moved here from Philadelphia, and coming from a big city, I was lost when I got to Yellow Springs and couldn't find any mountains or huge rivers or giant bridges but I've come to really love it. And I think um, I have spent my entire uh, adult life here from 1956 when I graduated from Antioch. I continued here. I was Arthur Morgan's, um, if anybody remembers who he was, um, his office manager for three years for the, toward the end of his working career when he was in his late 80s. And I really absorbed from him the idea of living in a small community. And because I came from Philadelphia, I've already I've been there, done that, and this was a perfect place. Now, over the years, the place has changed a lot. And I have, my family and I built two homes, and I've lived in two others in Yellow Springs. So I know the enormous considerations that go into building any sort of development, whether it's a two-bedroom bungalow or a four-story apartment house. Um, I just see nothing but real benefits for being able to provide reasonably priced housing, beautifully constructed with all kinds of the latest techniques for that, um, and still be able to stay in a, a small community where it wouldn't be completely priced out of everyone's pocketbook. And I see it headed in that direction in other communities around here, and I don't want to be one of those. So my heart is here, and I hope to continue being here, and I appreciate everything that people have been giving background on. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, Mark Crockett. I will say that, uh, first state, of all, state your name. my name is Mark Crockett, and um, I'm a Miami, Miami Township trustee. And um, I definitely favor this project um, as a 70-year-old who has recently had health problems. Um, I'm entirely in favor of the uh, the construction of this um, this building. I like the um, home ink. I like the architectural design. I like the firm. Um, I can't really say enough about the uh, about the overall project. Catherine Hitchcock. My name is Catherine Hitchcock. Hitchcock is my name tonight. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that has not been mentioned is, um, uh, like myself, there are many people um, my age, I'll be 70 in December, who live in a house that has three bedrooms. Um, a family room, a basement, a deck, and a front porch, and I'm one person in it. So when I leave that house, that house will become uh, available to a young family who can use those three bedrooms, use the basement, um, drink wine on the deck, and enjoy, <laughs> and enjoy the garden space because there's a nice yard there, which I can't take care of anymore. So um, I think this is the right time. I feel very um, excited. So thank you for all your work on this. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Dorothy Smith. My name is Dorothy Smith. I'd just like to say that I support this, and I don't have anything to add 
to what has already been said, but um, I, like the former speaker, I, I also live in a house that um, I'm not ready to give up yet, but um, <laughs> when I do, um, it'll be an open space for a young family. So I support this, and I support Home Inc. Catherine Roma. Hi, my name is Catherine Roma, and I really don't have too much to add. Um, I just want to thank you for uh, listening to all the great comments that have already been said, which I agree with, and I want to thank Home Inc. for doing this incredible amount of work. Um, so thank you. It really means so much to me and I think to other people here, so thank you. Laura Miller. My name is Lauren Miller. While I have a heartfelt understanding of uh, the need for low-income senior affordable housing, I do not support this project. Um, for a number of reasons, and, and one of which has not been really brought up to some extent, and that's in regards to fire safety. My son happens to be a firefighter EMT, so perhaps I'm, I'm thinking about this a little bit more. Um, I was concerned enough when I saw the four stories that I um, had a conversation with our fire chief about some of the issues. And um, every seven to 15 years, our community gets a rating um, of its ability to handle fires. And the reason why that's important to each one of us is because that is part of what influences our insurance costs, our household insurance costs. 50% is based on fire, the fire departments, such as equipment. That would include whether they have a ladder truck. A ladder truck is the only piece of equipment that can meet the needs of those people on that fourth story. There happens to be, I don't know how many apartments on that fourth story. Who are the lucky people who get to be up there and they don't have adequate uh, ladders uh, with the fire equipment? 40% is on water systems, and 10% of that community rating is based on the 9-11 system in place. So 50% is based on our equipment. A ladder truck costs approximately at least $700,000. Now, many of us have complained already about the cost of the new fire department. Um, I don't think our community is going to be very eager to pay more money to the tune of that degree to buy a uh, fire truck that would service this building. The alternative is what Chief um, said that they will be doing, and that is to elicit the support of a mutual aid call, and those uh, locations would be Xenia, Springfield perhaps, uh, Cedarville, I believe, are the three. That's going to take an average of 10 to 15 minutes additional time from the time that first um, delivery service equipment would arrive on scene. That's a long time for those individuals on the fourth, fourth floor. Now, if this is a building that's going to accommodate people who are 55 and older, I'm sure some of those people will have mobility, disability issues. Um, and I'm concerned about that. I understand that the building is driven by, uh, thank you, um, is driven by the design of the building, particularly the fourth floors, are, are designed because of the nature of the funding source and trying to gain these monies. I do understand that. But I think the site is, is way too small. It is 1.8 and some, and it should be, according to the requirements, five acres. It is way, way too small. I am a community member that lives in this area. I'm very concerned about the parking issue. 54 spots um, is one car per apartment. What about guests? Where are the guests going to park? What about more than three or four people who need dis disabled parking spots? Where are they going to park? I'm concerned as a person who lives in this neighborhood 
that they will be parking on the street, they will be parking in the fire department's parking uh, spaces which are adjacent, or friends care. I am concerned about the traffic in this area and I do perceive that we would have to, the village would have to uh, change some of the roads and that will be additional cost once more to the village. Lastly, I did uh, kind of figuring out how many people might be in this building and I based it on 39 one-bedroom units, 15 two-bedroom units, and if there was one person per unit, that would be at the very least 54 people. I looked at whether there could be, in which there absolutely could be, fifth, um, four to five people in those two-bedroom apartments. If there's children, grandchildren, there are relatives, I mean, where do we, I mean, what, what is the limit here? Anyway, so 54 really grows to 123 up to 231 people at the highest end. That is an awful lot of people to be putting on 1.8 some acres. This is a residential area. It does have a residential feel with, with friends care, certainly, and it will change because of the fire department. Okay, but we have five I'm, minutes. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, Laura Curtis. Thank you very much, Laura Curlis. I live at 1118 Livermore Street, so I live in the neighborhood. I'm not, I love Home Inc. I'm not against Home Inc. I love seniors. I'm not against seniors. <laughs> I'm against this project. And the reason I'm against this project is that the Housing and Urban Development uh, Commission at the federal government is the one funding it. And they will drive how this is built. They're driving the size. They're driving the number of units. And because this site is chosen, it's driving the height. And so I agree with everything Lauren Miller said. I'm going to say something else, something that surprised me. And, you know, I keep hearing how this it doesn't have an impact on the environment. One thing that's very important to me is the sky, the night sky, the day sky, the sun. There was a house recently built in my neighborhood, and, and the neighbor rightly said, my son went away because it had a super high pitch, pretty high roof line, okay? Denise's uh, comments very, I, are very well taken, except there's one that says there's no significant natural features to preserve. Well, the sky is a natural feature. And if you look at the sky footprint, imprint of this building, at least to my eye, like 20% of the sky goes away. This is what we feel when we go in big cities, like where's the sky? It's because the skyscrapers are taking up the sky. So this is an urban project in a village. That's what's happening here. If this was a two-story building, if there were 30 units, I wouldn't even be standing here. I think that this is too big, too much for where it is. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Joan Ackerman. Hi there, I'm Joan Ackerman, and uh, likewise, I think Home Inc. has done some wonderful things. I certainly know that we need some support for seniors. I'm a senior myself. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. However, this particular project is all we're talking about, and this particular project really bothers me because it goes against everything that I have seen and believed is appropriate in this village. When we look at um, metropolitan housing, for example, we purposely, we purposely put in small units that could be scattered throughout our community. That was the vision that we had for our community. I love the home ink buildings that are being scattered around our community, meeting many needs. When I look at a massive, and it, to me it's a behemoth, building like this, it goes against our basic uh, vision for our village. And I hate to say it, but the G word comes up in my head. The word ghetto, like we're putting all these people in one place. And I don't like that concept. I think all these people des who deserve to be here, whether uh, their families are here, whether they are here themselves or trying to downsize, deserve better than that. Um, they deserve to have village vision. 
which is the vision that we've had all these many, many years. And I hate to see that being given up only because the money available requires 54 units, and that doesn't seem to, the tail is wagging the dog here, if that's the measure we're using. I would like to see Homing continue to research this and come up with a better project, a better source of uh, income that could provide um, a building or buildings, my preference buildings, scattered throughout the village as we always have, that could meet the need without putting a behemoth like this in a residential neighborhood where it really does not belong. Thank you very much. Sure, Muller. Um, I've lived here 25 years. Um, I'm sorry, could you state your name, please? Oh, Sharon Muller. Yes, I, I've been here 25 years plus. I love Yellow Springs. My whole support system that I have is all my friends and everybody that knows or cares about me live here. Um, I'm wondering what I'm going to do when I can no longer do as well as I do now. And I think I, I read uh, programs about the golden girl thing where the elderly ladies all get together and live together and I think, ugh. I can't. <laughs> Nobody would want to put up with me because I'm used to living by myself, and but I really would like to have some like person like me within reach. So I think it would be so nice to have something like this to where there would be other people all around you as a support system. I, I think it's a wonderful idea. And, you know, I, I think if everybody's worried about the top floor, maybe you should figure out some fire escape thing from that floor. And, and as far as the, the height of the thing goes, you know, it's not making, it's not shading anybody's um, uh, solar system or something. So I don't see if it makes a long shadow, so what? <laughs> Henry Bogar? I am Andre Bogner and I thank Omin and St. Mary's Development Corporation for their plans to bring affordable senior housing to the village. I have lived in Yellow Springs for almost 25 years, and I know that efforts to bring senior rental housing have been going on for almost 20 years. So before Omin, French Care Community worked on the senior apartments project. So today I am asking a village planning commission and council to approve whatever needs to be approved for affordable senior housing apartments to become a reality in Yellow Springs. Thank you. Linda Grudowski. Hello, my name is Linda Radowski. Uh, I've lived in the village for 13 years. I work for a nonprofit. Uh, we provide uh, HUD funded um, housing uh, subsidy for persons with severe mental illness and who have been homeless. <laughs> so I'm familiar with um, funding driven projects and the parameters you have to fall within in order to get what's out there with the money. So I know that's a big challenge. I'm also a neighbor. I live on Herman. And um, I wanted to just share um, just a smidgen of um, what it's like to be a neighbor uh, to Friends Care. Um, it's 
fabulous. <laughs> we, uh, I've, I've seen many times, we've got to know each other on the path. Um, and you, uh, I, I'm, there's part of me that's really very excited about this opportunity to have uh, persons move, move into the neighborhood. Because I think if you're going to move into a neighborhood in Yellow Springs, that's the neighborhood to move into. Because we already know um, you know, that we, we see the aging process occur in front of us. And, and people say, well, what about the fire trucks? You know, they ask that already. And it's like, you know, when you live in a neighborhood like this, you, you very quickly, if you get out, if you move around, if you talk to your neighbors that live at Friends Care, you go from, oh, those fire sirens to, oh, I hope that's not Joe. <laughs> you know, they become your neighbor. And um, so, for that matter, I highly welcome the idea. Another reason is I um, hopefully with uh, these fire issues, um, they're resolved. I, I am a uh, HUD safety specialist, so I do believe uh, highly in safety. And so I think that uh, when it comes to accessibility, uh, precautionary things in place, it's good to have safety. Affordability is huge, especially for myself. Uh, I mean, there's a real possibility as a social worker, I might have to leave the village uh, as I age out. And I think that would be just um, horrendous for me personally. Um, the path that Friends Care has made uh, clear is very hard to uh, part with uh, because it's our little private secret in the neighborhood. But um, I, it's awesome. It is awesome. It's accessible. It's paved. It's beautiful. And I think it's an asset to this uh, project. I think this is probably one of many, many projects that Home Inc. will do. So rather than focus on just this one, let's keep that in mind. The issues I see in Herman is because I live down the hill, is yes, indeed, there was flooding from the last big rain we had about four years ago. I had a major flooding in my basement, lost my car, and that was because of the runoff. So that is a huge problem in the area. Uh, I wondered, I'll go really quick, like the golf cart parking, will there be that? Because uh, people that, uh, if friends care, right, golf carts, bicycles, and walks. So I suggest golf cart parking. Um, I think there will be home health visitors that will need parking spaces as well, as, rather than just residents. I think the uh, people don't use Xenia Avenue when they live on Herman, they use Livermore to go downtown, and that needs to be considered. That's where the traffic's going to go. The intersection of uh, Xenia Avenue and Herman right now is bad. It takes forever to pull out. It's going to get really bad <laughs> with this, so please keep that in mind. The other thing is just also keep in mind um, people are younger now than they were at these ages. So let's not look at them as, you know, um, people that are going to die any minute. These are people that come in with life and vitality. I want to encourage you to do everything you can, that there's mixes in the neighborhood and, and they become a part of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. And Richard Lapides. Hello. Uh, my name is Richard Lapides. I, to quote all the others, lived here a long time, 32 years, I believe. And, uh, I want to look at everything from a different perspective. If we were here 150 years ago, very different problems were occurring, and the, our forebears dealt with them pretty powerfully. They didn't do things piecemeal. They built four-story buildings of equal, if in the case of Maine Hall, greater size. Uh, and Maine, Maine was itself once a four-story building. It was converted later in its life in the, 20, in the 20th century. But um, given the scale of all other buildings in the vicinity, when those massive, high buildings were built, um, they were built with a great deal of pride, not a great deal of fear. And low, single uh, household buildings, single homes, were then affordable. But of course, single homes today um, are barely affordable. They're only affordable to a very small minority of the population. So looking at our own history, I would say that we are much more fearful of change and frightened of action than were the people who founded Antioch College. And by the way, those buildings are now highly regarded as keepers, and we only wish they would be on the historic register. That's how much we're, how fond we are of them. I believe this building is a keeper. I think our, the architecture is quite fine. They've done everything possible 
to soften it and to make it less homogenous. And uh, I can't imagine a better outcome given the problem they're trying to solve. So I thank them. Thank you all, too. That's all the names I have on the list. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? So my name is Amy Magnus. I live a couple of blocks down from Herman. I really love the idea of people making investment in rental properties in uh, the village of Yellow Springs. I think it will help its, uh, its, uh, uh, <coughs> it will, it will help the dynamics of the town. It will bring people in. It will um, uh, uh, be a positive force towards affordability. And, uh, and increasingly, we have to relook at the way we're doing housing, and co-housing just seems to be uh, uh, an appropriate way to go. So I'm very excited about this project. I've actually had experience with St. Mary's, and I really like their people. Um, they recently hosted a meeting at the Steamworks in Dayton, and it was extremely well received. I really like their approach to um, uh, including health in addition to the properties that they're building when they worked with the VA. This was an important aspect of it. Um, and they've recently hired someone looking at, um, let's see, first adopters in uh, kind of telehealth models. I'd really like that to be something that maybe we consider here because it looks like, I mean, the numbers that they've, that I've talked to them about is that you can save thousands of dollars a month the longer that you can keep somebody out of assisted living. Um, and uh, so this, I think this is a wonderful partnership and I think that it's uh, a, you know, will give a definite asset to the town in a in a location that you know has been a blank slate for a long time. I'm very happy to see this. I'm very happy to see the activity, uh, a a place in the village that, you know, just down the throat of it is you know one of the um, one of the, you know, a important heart of the village with the library at Antioch, with the wellness center, with the radio station. I'm very pleased to see this coming in. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you all very much for your participation. Where are No other comments, then I'm going to close the public hearing. Would we want to take a five minute break to allow people to clear up? If that's, if that's what people want to. It would be okay if we do. We're going to take a five minute break, and that way anybody who doesn't want to sit around and watch us deliberate won't have our wish. Encourage the folks. I feel bad. I was still laid back. Right. Why didn't wear a tie? I know. You told me that. I think we're going to try to take uh, a fairly deliberate approach to going through uh, the qualifying conditions one at a time and asking any questions. Uh, I'm going to start off 
Uh, just as a refresher reading, uh, the stated purpose of uh, planned unit development. Uh, just the text here, which uh, is on page two of the uh, packet. So, the planned unit development PUD district is established as an optional development tool to permit flexibility in the regulation of land development, to encourage innovation in land use, form of ownership, and variety of design, layout, and type of structures constructed to achieve economy and efficiency in the use of land, to preserve significant natural, historical, and architectural features in open space, to promote efficient provision of public services and utilities, to minimize adverse traffic impacts, to provide better housing, employment, and business opportunities, particularly suited to residents, to encourage development of convenient recreational facilities, and to encourage the use and improvement of existing sites when the uniform regulations contained in other zoning districts alone do not provide adequate protection and safeguards for the property and surrounding areas. It is the further intent of PUD regulations to promote a higher quality of development than can be achieved from conventional zoning requirements in furtherance of the vision and goals of the adopted comprehensive plan and vision Yellow Springs and Miami Township. Uh, and as I said, we're going to go through the qualifying conditions, but uh, we want to start, if I could ask uh, Johnny Burns to come up to the microphone, uh, public works director who's been sitting through the whole meeting, and apparently this was your day off. Thank you very much <laughs> for your patience. And uh, I'd like you, uh, if you could specifically address uh, some of the concerns that we may have heard, especially with potential traffic. Uh, the traffic could be a problem, and that's why we need to have a traffic study done. Yeah. And then that is a very difficult intersection to get out of. I agree with that. Is it the Herman? At Herman and Zingy Avenue, mm -hmm. which may require a traffic light pending the study. So um, the other areas of concern for me is the power-wise and that concern. Pardon? And it's the power requirements for the building. The electric. Uh, the electric problem. Uh, they're they're saying about a 600 amp. The cost that I gave them is based on that number. It could be more, depending on what they engineer. Uh, water. Um, Can I stop you for a minute? Yep. So, it might be. How how would that be a problem for the village? Are you saying that we don't have the capacity to serve? No, that? we have the capacity. We may just have to increase ours a little bit to be able to provide enough power for them. So there could be some added costs depending on what the final plans uh, come up with. They're right now saying that they may uh, 600 amp three phase. Uh, I think that's a little underestimated because they don't have no gas going to the site. So and where would you get that leg? Uh, we have both circuits right there. We just need to know which one we need to try to boost up a little bit. Are oh, you saying it would be an added cost for the village? It would be them? an added cost for the aid to construction. So right the, now, so that, gave, that's their cost. Correct. We gave them an aid to construction of nineteen thousand dollars, I believe, based on their engineers' information. But if it requires more than the aid to construction, will go up as well. Um, the water. I don't feel that the water is going to be a problem for the village. It is. You've got the most water that you can right there. Uh, the cost will be uh, the developers uh, on the developer's dime. Um, they will have to have some kind of pumping system, uh, but Friends Care has one too, so that's on the developer to do. Uh, John, you did mention that the plans showed it coming off at Marshall. The, the plans do show it coming off Marshall. It, it's always intended to be coming off of Herman because that's got a 10 inch main on Herman, it's got a four inch on Marshall. So the plans show it going to uh, Marshall. It needs to be reversed and go back to uh, Herman Street. Uh, sewer, we have uh, eight inch concrete to Livermore and then it's eight inch clay from Livermore to Cory. Uh, and it's not in the best of shape, but it can be uh, relined. And that needs to be done prior to and Emily did state that they may be able to help share in the cost of that as well. Would that be something that the village would be planning to do anyway? It's not on our radar, but if this project goes further, 
uh, it'd be a fast track because we need to get that done prior to having more uh, infrastructure put into that. The big concern that I have is storm. There is no storm. There's a storm on the south side, and it is a problem. There, uh, the detention pond, I don't know how that's going to be designed, and it's still yet, it's out there, but uh, on large rainfalls, there is a lot of flooding in that area. But it's a way all over town as well. So uh, we've got a, a RFQ out there. We're getting ready to review on storm studies, but uh, storm needs to be taken in consideration because whatever they produce, it cannot become their neighbor's problems, and that goes all the way down to the Antioch field uh, is where the outlet and that goes straight down to the Glen. Um, I think that there was an implication that it's possible that providing their uh, water stormwater system that it will actually improve the current. Well, I mean, right now there's and nothing. No, there's some hard right surface, no, and it just runs off, or or it but, gets absorbed. And I agree with that, but it's it's not all hard surface. That's true. And yeah. so now you're going to put a building there that's going to collect it all. You've got a parking lot that's going to collect it all, and you got all the other parts and pieces that is now funneling it straight down to a detention pond. So whereas it is now, it all naturally lays, except for where there is some asphalt or concrete there. Fire station will be the, the same fire issue. station is going to be the same thing. So uh, the fire station is probably going to tie into the, the Zinia area, and then this project would tie into the uh, Harmon Street side. Stormwater is probably been my number one because the lack of in that area. I have one other question. I'm not okay. sure who would answer it, though. I, what is involved in a traffic study? Who does it? How long would it take? That would be uh, Denise. They would, somebody would have to come out. I don't know if that would be somebody like Capital Electric that we have our traffic signals through. They yeah. could come out and, and they do usually do study. like a traffic count, like so basically have somebody that just correct from they put a loop thing across the street. The loop. And, and I will tell you, there's a lot of buses that go up and down there. Uh, and if any part of that road is blocked, we'll definitely get a phone call from to the village about it because it's so hard to turn in and out of on that road. Mm -hmm. So on Herman, off of Zinga and off of Herman on the road. And any light uh, traffic light and signal device would have to correlate with a call from the township. So if the township gets a call, that light can't go to red, they'll signal that light to go green to get through that light no matter what. So at what point does it, it, does it do you, what point, what's the threshold for when you know you need to have light? Is there a certain number of cars or per day or? I don't know if in this case ODOT would be involved, but it is a state highway. Right. And, you know, so ODOT is going to have a say relative to where that light is, if there is a light, and at what count they're going to mandate it. Okay. There's the cost. Um, <laughs> I can't answer that. Um, I don't have it in my budget, I can tell you that. Uh, now, the road improvement, I think, because of the buildings that would go there, I think it would go to the developer but I can't answer that for sure thank you John. thank you so is it uh, agreeable to everybody that I was just going to start uh, if you look in your packets at the bottom of page two going through the qualifying conditions one at a time Mm -hmm. yes. So, uh, again, the text, in order to qualify for PUD approval, the project must satisfy the conditions of this section. It is the applicant's responsibility to demonstrate in writing that each of the following criteria is or will be met by the proposed PUD. So, uh, A, 
recognizable benefit. A PUD shall achieve recognizable and substantial benefits that would not be possible under the existing zoning uh, classifications. At least three of the following benefits shall be accrued to the community as a result of proposed PU, uh, PUD. Uh, the first one was preservation of significant natural features. Any comment? I don't think that there are any natural no. features. Uh, number two, a complementary mix of land uses or housing types. Um, and, yeah, and I don't uh, know the, what uh, you had stated there, the staff was that the project does not meet the criteria because there's not a complementary use of, uh, mix of land use or housing types. Uh, my take on that mm -hmm. is that I agree with staff. Um, I think that that neighborhood, the size of that neighborhood, um, even the fact that Friends um, has a residential scale to it as opposed to a, an institutional scale, um, does not make this particular design complementary to the mix of land uses adjacent. Uh, and number three, extensive open space and recreational amenities. Yes. Yeah. Yes on that one. Yes. Uh, four, the connectivity of open spaces with new or existing adjacent greenway or trail corridors, corridors, pathways for bicycles and pedestrians incorporated throughout the development and along the perimeter streets. And as we've had the additional feedback from uh, uh, Friends Care Center about the trail there. Yeah, and I think that the connectivity is really well done. I think um, the idea that with the massing of the building to be able to let the neighborhood kind of cycle back from Herman to the east side of the development property over to Marshall is a great idea. I think that um, trying to establish a link to what we would have as a bus stop connection with green cats eventually would be something that the planning commission might want to advocate for um, so that there is a scheduled and maybe a protected stop that would also add to that um, certainly with the senior center i think that those kinds of things are all part of what connectivity is all about Um, next one, uh, number five, a preservation of small town appeal. I, I think that, well, I, I've, I've been waiting for a, a time to give a little brief on where I come from relative to warehousing of seniors in mass. Um, 20 years ago, I guess, 15, 20 years ago, we did a visioning process in the village. The visioning um, process indicated that the small town feel, um, that the sense of community, that um, neighborhoods caring for seniors, integrating seniors into the neighborhoods, as well as other elements to reestablish our neighborhoods as social corridors, is first and foremost on who Yellow Springs is. That visioning process evolved into a new zoning code. And I would match our zoning code to any community zoning code in terms of anticipating those needs for our seniors, our communities, our front porch character, our eclectic character, our lack of homogeneous identity, um, individualism, and establishing those neighborhoods back into something that we are really, really trying to bring back, unlike other suburban communities or even some urban communities in the area. Um, part of the trends that I read in <clears throat> some of my literature is that the trends toward senior living is to try to continue to keep them part of households and integrate them back into the neighborhood on a small scale.
so that they feel like they are connected again to the community as a whole, so that there is an opportunity for a larger scale village to take care of our senior community on a larger scale, not in one warehouse institutional concept where you try to take care of them all in one lump sum. Um, I don't see that trend as being something <clears throat> that is sustainable. So um, with that, I think that um, the scale of, in terms of density is a real problem for me when it comes to things like uh, preservation of small scale and appeal to the community. Okay, so we're on five. Preservation mm -hmm. of small town. Okay, I, I'd say probably no. Would we agree? Well, I mean, you know, I... I mean, it, when you think of small town. Well, you know, you know, just me looking at the criteria and thinking about what that can possibly mean is that I don't see that it's damaging the small town appeal. I mean, it's obviously a large housing facility, but I don't know that it challenges the preservation of the small townness of the rest of our small uh, town. Yeah, and I'm not yeah. disputing that. I'm just, yeah. you know, when we could talk about well, what is small town appeal, and I could give a little uh, thing on how it is small town appeal, but I think that what this means is sort of small little buildings and, uh, I mean, it's an urban thing. Are we becoming urban, more urban place? Yeah, I think we are, and I think it's a good thing. But if we're only supposed to be looking at what this means and not our own values, mm -hmm. then I would just say, let's say, no, I'm, I'm okay with no on preservation of small town appeal and move on. I only need three, right? Well, that b brings a question, then, because I have no idea where you fell on connectivity of open space. There was not a Pardon? kind yeah. of a poll taken. I don't, I don't know where you've fallen on these. If that is oh, what you're doing is go going through and, them. yeah, okay. got right. nothing. Okay, so if we just go back to, uh, one, the preservation of natural features. And I have the comment that there weren't really any, right. but I didn't get a yes or no, so. I don't think it applies. It doesn't apply. Yeah. Okay, so it's no. not applicable. All right. Complementary mix of land use types. No. 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 Uh, extensive open space and recreational amenities, I think it was yes. 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 Uh, the connectivity was a yes. 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 Uh, preservation of small town appeal. No. No. Okay. Is it three no's and one yes? No. So you're a yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. So six uh, improvement to public streets and other public facilities that mitigate traffic, and or developmental impacts. So the staff cannot determine well, without, I mean, it's, without it's, the traffic study. <coughs> but it's no anyway because it's not, yeah. they, they're not, right. yeah. this no, project isn't improving anything. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, no. Sorry? No. Right. So six would be a no. Seven. Uh, coordinated development of multiple small parcels. That's yes. a yes. 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 Is everyone yes on yes. that? Yes. yes. Eight. Removal or renovation of blighted buildings, sites, or contaminated cleanup. Uh, says that this site does not meet the criteria as there's no blight or contamination. Oh, I disagree. I think it is a blighted site. It's been sitting there uh, with that concrete there and empty for, I don't know, a decade or whatever it is, would be considered. certainly looks more blighted than the Vernet site, which truly is. So I, I say yes for eight. There's a definition in the Ohio Revised Code in Section 1.08, uh, blighted area defined, that would indicate that this parcel does not meet that definition. I agree with that. It does not. The legal definition of what that Correct. determines. Correct. So that means. Although our, our co the code is silent as to that definition, but the fallback would be to go to the state code under those circumstances. If there is a portion of that parcel that does have um, bad soils, it's where they backfill the basement, but that's on the township side. You know, this portion 
of that lot in general is just asphalt and that's it. I mean, certainly if there was some evidence of contamination and the need for remediation, that could change, but there's no, yeah. but there's no evidence of that at this yeah. time. And the township would have seen that going through their environmental to do their construction documents. So. Right. So, uh, and so eight's going to have to be a no. You can mention B on the size. Okay. Uh, B, size, each community shall uh, contain a minimum of five acres. Provided sites containing less than five acres may be considered for rezoning to PUD if the village council determines that the site will advance the purpose of the PUD district. When determining the appropriateness of areas less than the applicable minimum to require, the village council shall determine that one, rezoning the area to PUD will not result in a significant adverse effect upon nearby or uh, adjacent village lands. Two, the proposed uses will complement the character of the surrounding area. Three, the purpose and qualifying conditions of the PUD district can be achieved within a smaller area. And four, the PUD is not being used as a means to circumvent conventional zoning requirements. Comments on? Um. My feeling about that is, you know, I, I take a tact that, you know, this goes to experience, but, you know, if I, if I look at a project proposal to any community that I'm practicing in for a client, my first purview is to try and identify what those existing zoning constraints are and then see what my client's needs are and design to that constraint. Um, if I can't do that and the client wants to move forward, we always go through a process of what does that mean and how much can we do without adverse effect to the community through their zoning process. Um, I, I think that in a case where we are looking at doubling, I mean almost doubling the height and doubling the mass and density is a precedent that planning commission is going to set if it agrees to moving forward with this for our purpose of the zoning review uh, that is detrimental to these conditions and I think therefore that the PUD process could in fact be a means to circumvent the conventional zoning requirements. I, I think that um, there is reason to consider this for a PUD at the site that it is. Um, I, I do think that the traffic thing could, I mean, I think that needs to be studied. But other than that, I don't think that it uh, results in significant adverse effects on nearby or adjacent village land. Um, I think that the proposed use definitely complements the character of the surrounding area being as it is right beside Friends Care. I think that is an exceptional use of that site for that. Um, and I disagree that it's, that it's trying, that it's, I don't say purpose of qualifying conditions. Purpose and qualifying conditions of the P district can be achieved within a smaller area. That's basically saying, can you present a project that fits within the zoning and achieve the goals the, as uh, set? The, the zoning code as it stands. Yes. So that would be no. That's why you have a parallel site plan. Pardon? That's the parallel site plan. Oh, yeah, okay. Does it fit the number of units that the applicant wants? No. But can there be a project submitted that can fit on that property that there? is a senior housing, affordable housing no. project? No, the answer yeah. is no. No, it, it but can't you're be. you're doing it in other places. You're building doubles, you can build quads, you can build other smaller units. No, no homing no. can't do those not things? Yeah, not, with, not to get this funding. There's, there's a middle ground there that you can't do it. Right. So the smaller project, But our about six units, then the cost of this land would not support that project. Which would 
this. What's the minimum number of units you need? We, we, need, we need somebody at the microphone, please. Okay. Um, so, since this is no longer a seriously public meeting, I'll, I'll explain a little bit further in more detail. But it, it's still a public. I meeting. know it's still a public <laughs> meeting. But okay, so. Yeah. Right. So the the balance that we have is if if we really believe in this project, we have to as kind of like you were talking about from an architectural standpoint, we have to we have to be focused on the public housing policy of the agency. And they want as many units as you can build as and, and keep the cost down. We also back that up with the need. We, we pretty much demonstrated the need in the community for a lot of units of senior housing. So if the minimum in the plan is 45 units, but if you do 46 units, you're, more, you're better off than you if, if you do 45. And my, just laying it out there, my concern is at the, at the competitive nature of this, I ran the numbers to get to the 54, it could have been 53 or 55, but that's about what you can build for what money is available. So we're trying to balance the need with the competitiveness and with taking maximum amount of use of the land, not only the acreage of the land, but the cost of the land, which the cost of this land per acre is far exceeds what we typically see, but because of uh, the efficiency that ADA has come, ATA has come up with, uh, it, it fits. It, it works very well. So just being transparent. <laughs> and you mentioned you need to bid to on the funds, or did I misunderstand oh, that? Yeah. Okay. Last year, oh, sorry. What? Last year there were 79 applications. Uh -huh. 26 were approved. Okay. Uh, in the non-urban pool, there are two types of uh, projects. The senior facet of the non urban pool and also the family. So we have to, we're not only competing against other senior deals, we're competing against other family deals. And this pool is smaller than, for example, the, the urban senior pool, which they've got five or six pools. So the, uh, the tax credit limit is less, or the, or the maximum is less in this pool than in other pools recognizing the balance between urban and rural and so forth. So there's a lot of different um, pieces to the puzzle that we're trying to balance to, to get what we feel is, is, the, is a great project. So. And I totally agree and understand. I mean, it's not, you know, I, I absolutely understand what dilemma that you guys have given this particular property. From a strictly zoning point of view, my job is to look at this from our zoning code and establish what deviations we have to consider. And in those considerations, funding sources don't count because if you were a market rate and you wanted to put nothing but 55, 54 million dollar units on this property and we had to evaluate that criteria because that's the funding that they want to provide. We get shot down. And, and so I have to make sure that we have record of why we're trying to push this thing forward and how and at what considerations the zoning has to offer. Now, having said that, what we do from a zoning point of view is not going to have any bearing on what council says because council is the one who considers the funding, the need, sure. the, the, the availability of those funds, and they're the, the venue in which that you're going to get approval. It has really nothing to do with what we're trying to do. We're just trying to give a recommendation for how it deviates from our zoning code. Sure. So don't get me wrong. No, I, no, you no. Know. Um, if, do I need to say my name again? Okay. Um, if I may make a point. I just, my understanding is that the plant unit development zoning overlay is for one-time special projects achieving a special purpose that won't be replicated. 
and that the onus is on the developer to show how we meet or exceed a community benefit to balance out any deviations in terms of the modification of these minimum requirements. I think council already approved us to proceed with an application on less than five acres, which is the section that you're deliberating right now. So I don't know if you need to, I, I don't know if you need to re-deliberate it or if, or if what council decided stands, but one of the incentives in the zoning code is to provide affordable housing. One of very few incentives in terms of the density modification. Um, and so we're not only committing to provide 10% affordable or 20%, we're going 100%. And I think that should be given some consideration alongside the impact on infrastructure, fire safety, some of these other issues that we've really been trying to work with village staff to um, And to I think, address. you know, and I, I agree that, you know, given, given the demographic that this project is putting forth, the conversations around planning new communities, planning development within the village has all been around the idea of mixed income development. That is a big thing mixed income and I'll go back to this example if somebody wants to put in nothing but market rates affordability is a huge issue here we want that developer to provide a minimum of 20 percent affordable unit within that market rate development because we want that diversity in that mixed income product mm -hmm. to go and say our product has an, a narrow scope of income rate and you have to apply within that narrow scope of income rate and exclude these other elements does not necessarily mean that you're fulfilling all the nature of that demand. I think there's equations that need to be applied to. Um, and I'll get into some of those later, but you know, I'm trying to make the case that if, if this development is gonna move forward, we wanna make sure that we're not putting all the eggs in one basket and the next development down the road doesn't continue to glut that particular demographic. Um, well, <laughs> there is so little chance of that happening. Uh, I, I mean, the, first of all, I, I do have some expertise in this. So, so this is a long shot. You, you know, it's a long shot that they'll get funded. And if they, they get funded, we're never going, we will, it will be a decade or so before anything like this could happen. Now, ideally, it would be really nice if we'd have nice little neighborhoods and nice little, little tiny houses and 20 or 30 or whatever percent of those were affordable. That would be really nice. Now, is that practical? Is that doable? No. So if we want to have an ideal in which we think, oh, well, we're gonna have a, apartment building with all ages in it and it's going to have 20 percent affordable and but it's not going to be an apartment i mean there's the ideal and then there's what we can do now i truly do not think we want to do this if we if we think it's going to damage the area i don't want to do that but let's not compare what an ideal thing is that's not possible to something here that has some chance of happening some chance. It, probably they won't get funded, truly, because it is so competitive. Well, okay, I'm being a little off, but I mean, hopefully they will be funded. But I mean, this is such a competitive thing. Yes. And if it, this gets funded once, it's not going to happen again here. There's not, there's not going to be any glut on the market for other developers who are going to come in. Hey, I want to do another tax credit project. Yeah. So should we just vote? I think so. <laughs> yeah, because this is ultimately determined by council. What, what okay. council did is they said that, that that if planning commission goes forward, that they will then cons ultimately consider the, the five acre deviation. But certainly, in the context of whatever planning commission makes a recommendation on, they can planning commission can address that deviation in the context of their recommendation. Is it 
pertains to size? Yeah. <laughs> well, because the thing each PPO shall contain a minimum of five acres, and, and this is obviously what they're. I think in the context of how this relates back, is there anything that Planning Commission would, would like some language that the, the Planning Commission would like to appear in the report that goes to Council because the, it's approved, disapproved, or approved with modification. Right. So it's one of those three. So whatever it is that, that wants to address Planning Commission's concern, concern or pro or con in some way. And because ultimately, I mean, the way I'm feeling right now is I, you know, I don't object to the size of the project. I don't either. I, I do have the traffic concern, and I yeah. think if we're so going to put it somewhere, this might be here that we need to have uh, understand what traffic implications are, and if there need to be some changes to streets or lights or whatever and how that would be paid for. I do object to the size. I think it's too large. I disagreed with <clears throat> with section four of it as far as it being used as a means to circumvent, circumvent conventional zoning requirements. I think that's kind of what it would appear to be. But I also think it's too large for the size. Two, two no's and two yeses, so how does that, that's it, 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 it would It's a no in the context that, on, that three votes are required, but that would be reflected in, in the recommendation to council. Um, next one is uh, utilities. If you use to serve with public water and sanitary sewer, that's yeah. all yes, right? Uh, for ownership, or D, ownership, the PUD shall be filed by the property owner, leasee, other person with uh, legal interest in the property, written consent by the owner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so that the information hasn't been provided right. yet. Um, and, and it needs to be, because we don't really know what, um, how that is going to, um, who's going to, who is responsible for the development in terms of paying for the project as it goes through? I mean, could something happen and then who ends up being responsible or how do you have that worked out as far do you guys take can you, the? Can you repeat the full well, question so I can make sure? I sorry, answer sorry. So yeah. from the beginning of the, from construction through the end of it until it's completed, is it St. Mary's that's responsible for the development and 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 deals with the funding for the construction of that? I'm oh, yeah. not clear on yeah, any of this. We're responsible. There's a uh, the the pre-development costs are a wild card until you get awarded. And we're fully responsible for those. That's it's about twenty-five to forty thousand dollars to do an application. Then the development costs, whatever those, you know, I don't want to show show no. a number because, but you know, yeah. you know about what it is. Right. So from that, from the moment that we close, until that thirty-year restrictive covenant expires, we're responsible. Now, after. There, there could be sh some adjustment in, in ownership after year 15, but Ohio Housing Finance Agency requires the Community Housing Development Organization, which we are, to be involved in the project for 30 years. And the, the additional money that we get from the state, it's, uh, a, uh, it's a loan, but it's, it's a, if you, if you operate the property as affordable housing, that loan, doesn't have to be repaid. That's strictly from the state. That's not even tax credits. That's not, that's not out of the Ohio Housing Trust Fund. So that also has a 30-year term. So we're when we're involved in a project, we're involved. We're not going anywhere. Uh, we've been around since 1989. We, you know, we are fully involved in a project. Wes, once the project is, is done, assuming you get the funding and, and, and the, the prod, the development is complete. Right. Who then is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of 
the, the housing? I can make it very personal. I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, so so St. Mary's, for the next 30 years, St. Mary's would be involved in yeah, the... We do not, we do not um, manage directly. Okay. We hire a, uh, many of you have perhaps heard of National Church Residences. They're very, uh, one of the top management companies in the country. Uh, their headquarters is in Upper Arlington. They have a lot of their own properties, and they're ones that we hired to do our Dayton area properties in, as of September 1st, 2013. So they have all the bells and whistles, all the ca capability, income certifications, all the background checks, all of those things, house rules and things like that that you go in. Yeah, yeah. So here's, uh, <coughs> here's also, um, here's how the project is, is set up. Um, initially, uh, like I mentioned, we are, it's the acronym is a CHODO, what that is the Community Housing Development Organization. There's only five or six of us in Ohio that are capable of doing what we're trying, we're proposing to do. Uh, so we would be initially the 100% general partner, and then the limited partner is very likely to be Ohio Housing, uh, Ohio Corp Ohio Housing Corporation for Housing. Um, and that's a public, is that a state entity? State they, are, they are a private not-for-profit. Okay. Ohio Capital Corporation for Housing. I, it's, uh, <laughs> I got it. I had to think about that. Um, they've also been around since 1989. And um, just like St. Mary, uh, no project has, has ever failed. They, they would, if something happened to St. Mary or, or Home Inc. and money needed to be put into the project, they come and they write the check. They take care of it because tax credits are not in front of the lender's position. So that's, that's, how, that's how it's structured. So they own, there's a limited partner and they're the limited, we're the general partner. There will be plans for homing to take some ownership after year 15, that's the state rules, not our rules. Uh, reading through the staff recommendation that more detailed documentation on how the property will be managed and maintained in the final plan review. Oh, yeah, we can, we can all that. that. There in the final. So yeah. the minimum partner there, what's their name? What is the, the name of that? I didn't catch the uh, Ohio Capital Corporation for Housing. Ohio Capital yeah, they're, Corporation they've, uh, for Housing. They raise about $300 million a year for tax credits. Okay. And we would be in one of their funds. This, uh, there's a, as Emily uh, reminded me, there's, there's oversight that St. Mary provides. There's also oversight that Ohio CAP provides in the sense that they, they look at all the financial statements quarterly, they do annual inspections, uh, and then Ohio Housing Finance Agency also comes in and is, has oversight to this project. So it's a very heavily regulated business. And, and so uh, the average occupancy for seniors in the country is about 96 or 97 percent occupancy. Uh, so very few of these projects are in peril. And uh, you know we just um, we just see Yellow Springs as a you know a tremendous need and, and a you know and tremendous partner to work with. So just to be clear, then so when the, the St. Mary's will hire a property manager that you've, you've mm -hmm. partnered with since yeah. 2013. Yeah, okay. and if they, for some reason, they, we have others that um, if, they, if they chose not to that are highly capable, that or other, we have other partners okay. besides them. Okay. You know, we could, there's two other ones that I would uh, be very familiar, I won't say their names, but that, that you would know sure. off, the, off the top of your head. So we, uh, we have that covered. Just to follow up real quick, would that, management company hire locally is that or is that an external organization well they the way I think it would typically work is if um, they would hire let's say they would hire maintenance and grounds folks they would try you know they would try to hire locally now the manager may not reside in Yellow Springs it just depends on what you know who's available but you want you know obviously it's they're very professional so that's and we would try to work, you know, locally with, with subcontractors as well, but, you know, there may not be a brick mason that's available 
at that moment for a drywaller <laughs> that would be available at that moment to to participate. But it's it's always yeah, and, and I will I can tell you that our the uh, contractor would be Greater Dayton Construction, who is very well versed in LIHTC. They're a part of they're a wholly owned uh, subsidiary of Ober, Ober companies, and we've worked with them a lot. And they're uh, extremely uh, well versed in this world. So, so not to bore you with all the detail. No, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. Well, the, 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 you know, I think something. That, Planning Commission needs to understand it needs to yeah. be in the record now so that, yeah. it, that they I mean, can weigh all those pieces. I, I will say that, you know, I, I understand, you know, especially with Ted here, where he's coming from. Um, I think there's some, there's, there's some challenges with the size. I understand that, but I do believe this is a great project and, and we can, we can deliver it. Assuming we get told yes by the housing agency. <laughs> We've got to get the credits. <laughs> So who has the deed to the property, Home Inc. or St. Mary? Right now, Home Inc. Does. Home Inc. But then that'll transit. You're going to? The, w the way these are set up, and we have to work out how the community land trust participates. That's above my pay grade. I, I need my real estate attorneys to and Ohio CAP to look at that. But I'm sure there's a way to do it the way you know, we need to do it. Um, the, the structure is that we would form an operating entity that's a for-profit entity. We're a not-for-profit, so is Home Inc. That's a for-profit entity, and there, the ownership is this general partnership plug-in and this limited partnership plug-in. And so that entity is the one where you know all the all the leases are signed by that entity. Uh, Why is it for-profit? Well, glad you asked. <laughs> The, this, the section, section 42 of the tax code, which, ha, which handles all of this stuff, it's a unique section. So when investors invest in tax credits, unlike a, like, like if you, let's say we all got together here and we bought a small retail center and we put in a million dollars and after 10 years we decided to sell it for one and a half million dollars. Well, in that scenario, all that money, that original investment comes back to you. In the tax credits, the tax investors, tax credit investors never get their principal back. What they get is tax credits and they get tax losses. They get the depreciation and the, and the significant tax losses and that's what creates their return. And their return right now is a relatively modest, about five and a quarter, five and three quarters percent internal rate of return over 15 years. That's what their investment return is, which isn't very much compared to what it used to be because of tax reform act. So, so that's how, that's why it's a for-profit entity, but they're allowed to write off losses to the extent that they have investment. So if they invested, you know, seven million dollars in the project, they can take a lot. A lot of times, it doesn't add up to that, but you can't take more than you put in, you know, you're not allowed to do that, so. I know this is extremely riveting. <laughs> yeah. Will you be selling the tax credits? We don't sell, that's what the equity is. We don't, we don't, what we do is the, the agency, the housing agency, yeah, I'm sorry, the housing agency grants the credits to us through this competitive application process, then we could use Ohio Capital, we could use Royal Bank of Canada, we could use uh, Key Bank, we could use a lot of different groups, but we choose to use Ohio Capital because they've been great to work with and they have a great support staff. They're the ones that go out and raise the money for the investors to buy the credits. So the, the housing agency is kind of like the referee and Ohio Cap and St. Mary are the players. It's kind of how it is. Is that how it is? Yeah. Yeah. I know like some utilities that pay the tax credit to be sold. Will, can you sell yours? And if so, are you? Well, what I have to do is once I, once I contract with Ohio Capital, I, all that money comes into the deal. 
and it's it's hard invested into the deal. So I can't. It's it's hard coded, if you will, into the real estate. So I can't I can't sell the credits. There's there's no, and they can't either under the rules. Okay. Do we have enough information to? Yeah. <laughs> we'll make a decision. I guess say I, sorry. Yeah. I, I try to. Are you guys? <laughs> no, it, it's it's in the record. I think it was okay. important information okay. that it, that you need to hear as a body. And obviously, yeah. over the next twelve months, it, right. it further fleshed out. Okay. So, everybody, is that a yes on that one? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Uh, e, comprehensive plan and vision. Uh, Proposed uses and design of the PUD shall be substantially consistent with the village's adopted comprehensive plan and the principles for land stewardship contained in the vision, Yellow Springs and Miami Township. And you, uh, uh, staff supplied the quotations for uh, regarding uh, infill, emphasis on infill. Yes. Comments about that one? Yes. I'm a yes on that one as well. Uh, Potential no. residents of all income levels, implying mixed income as a priority. Make provisions, it says the comprehensive plan states make provisions for a range of housing opportunities, costs, and choices that provide safe quality housing for current and potential residents of all income levels. Yes, I think that. Um, it's not making housing opportunities for all potential income levels. I think it is quality. I think that it is safe. I think it's infill. It is infill. So are you yes or no on this? Well, I just, you know, it, it, to me, it's again, it's a matter of making a statement that on planning commission, we advocate for mixed income development. We do. And this particular project is not that. But does every project have to include every housing? No, but it, it's going to be a pushback for us if a market rate person comes in here and says, I don't want to have any affordable housing components to my development. I want to be able to say, well, we've promoted mixed income on all of our applications, not have an exception because it's an affordable housing funding source. I mean, I think that's just dangerous for us as a planning commission. Now, if it's not for council, but it is, I think it is for us. And I want to be on the record okay. stating that. Do we have a yes, a yes, a no? Yes. Next one, F, pedestrian accommodation. PUD shall provide for integrated, safe, and abundant pedestrian bicycle access. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes on that one. Uh, architecture, building forms, relationships, scale, and sizes shall be harmonious and visually integrated. Mm. No. No. coming in of me uh, was harmonious and visually integrated. Uh, those are... There's two no's already. Yeah. There's two no's already. Okay. So right. I, I'd be There's yes. two no's two already, no's so yes. let's yeah. move on. Uh, traffic, H. The PUD shall provide for safe and efficient vehicular movement, and obviously that has to be studied. I think we can make a recommendation for a traffic study. Yeah. Then we get up to I, eligible districts, land within any zoning district may qualify for PUD. Yeah. What time are we looking at here? We might be able to 
about 1254 mm -hmm. Yeah. Because A, I mean, A is, I mean, that's not even anything that you vote right. on. It just is what it is. And um, um, B. Um, lot size requirement. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's where you get into it. So. <clears throat> I think that we can state that it satisfies all of the site requirements in, in terms of density except number of units per, per acre. acre. Yeah, we, that's about two thirds of the way down page seven is where we get to the density concerns. Um, I want to, I think we need to go back for a second. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, on the utilities, I think that oh, we need to make to yeah, we kind of passed over that, but I think that we need to address the cost to the village for lining the sanitary sewer, for um, identifying the power source for the electric, qualifying that there is not gas, and um, I think it would be a good idea to have the applicant civil engineer and our hired review engineer work on the impact of the stormwater all the way down the system to the glen. Okay, I'd like to go. The first thing that you said was about the cost of aligning the sewer. Yes. I think that's something that needs to happen. Yes, it, this would have it happen sooner than later, but what the village is doing is working on upgrading our infrastructure. And so for $27,000 to line the sewer, I, I don't see that as an issue. I don't remember. Um, the, uh, well, I think that it becomes an issue if the allocation of funds are prioritized for a particular development and some system that is more depleted than that system gets pushed back another year because of this priority. So again, it's, it's a way of priorities. You know, so if this priority and if it changes, then the public needs to know, you know, whoever's in line is getting bumped. So you just, going back to utilities, the concern you raised, have that put in our... Yes. Uh, yes. About that. Yes. Can you restate those? Because I only caught like a couple of them. You mentioned so, sewer. You, know, you said something about electric. Upgrade. Yeah. Determining where the power source for the electric is going to come from to achieve the 600 amp three phase. The, you know, it's close by, but at what cost to hit, to get to that transform? You know, and then uh, no gas. And there is no gas, natural gas. They're not using gas. No, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There is no natural gas plan for the site. So you're just saying to note just that? Just making a statement. It's an all-electric. And then on stormwater, just a more comprehensive. Yes. That would be a little more stormwater situation. Yeah. Sorry. Nope, that's fine. Thank you. And then the last one everybody got was on the, the two civil engineers working, working on the stormwater. Yeah. The applicant's responsibility is to the site, the property line. The village's responsibility is to see the impact all the way down to where it dumps into the land. You know, and then determine what need, what improvements need to be done to take the extra volume of water, if there is an extra volume of water. Well, how would there be, what would cause an extra volume of water? I mean, it's the same amount of rain happening. No. Then as. Yeah. This is. You're not heard from me yet. <laughs> My name is John Hawes with St. Mary Development Corp. As the site sits now, about two fifths of it is covered with blacktop or crushed <coughs> gravel that it does not allow for any permeability to the site. So all that water is running off immediately. It rains, it runs off. There is no catch basin, there is no stormwater retention on that property now. 
the grassy areas as they are there now, they would allow some filtration of the water, but there is still some runoff. The way the code is set up for detention ponds, we have to catch all of our hard surface water, which means that it all goes into a pond and then it is let out slowly. And the calculations will be that we have to, I think it's a 50 year rain we have to hold for one hour. We have to hold that for one hour, 50 year rain. So that way the calculation is we'll be letting out a small amount over a long period of time, whereas now you're letting out that water that's hitting that two fifths of that property immediately. So that's the difference in what the storm water would be. It should lessen it greatly. I mean, it should go down drastically. So it should help the neighbors downhill. And for our purpose, and I agree, and I understand. Okay. I, to okay. I totally understand. You know, the, what I think that what we're trying to say to staff and village council and to the citizens is that your water management is being dealt with for an improvement. Right. However, we need to also make sure that the people downstream appreciate and understand that to be a fact and that our engineer is going to work with you to ensure that that happens. So that in the event of that flood, they ain't coming back and yelling at us. <laughs> okay. okay, so we were at the so, with the lot front. So, so the, 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 the recommendations then would include the three areas that Ted is just Summarized. Right. Sewer relining the electricity and utilities. And uh, stormwater. Line the sewer, the, the cost to uh, the to <coughs> turn more the electric source right. and transform it into the yeah. uh, stormwater. Did you, it, since you dropped back to that for a second, then did you want to get a little more specific on the traffic regarding cost and funding of the traffic and any necessary improvements, or do you want to hold off? if that gets to a final site plan. It seems like you're identifying costs here. It, uh, there it is. You can leave it or not, but. Um, I'm thinking of just a notation for, for council to be aware of that. Well, I think that we can um, at least ask ODOT or inform ODOT of what the plan is and see what ODOT says about trying to verify any traffic level or a concern that they may have at that particular intersection. That's, that's, that would be for Highway 68. Yes. Herman uh, and 68. Would that cover like concerns about Livermore? Mm -hmm. No, it wouldn't touch mm -hmm. Livermore. But, I mean, if, if ODOT identifies a problem, right, um, then we can always ask whatever traffic study is being done on 68 to also the other end of it being looked at at Livermore, right? I mean, it's just another counter. Okay. So then my recommendation is that ODOT be contacted and any criteria established for consideration of that intersection and a higher density traffic. At least get some parameters. Because I don't know that they're going to, I don't know that anything, you know, 54 cars, half of 54 cars is going to make a dent in the traffic problem. <laughs> Um, We're not parking, there, no thing. parking on my end is, you know, I, I agree that too much parking is the norm. Um, I think that if there is a relationship with friends care, um, overflow parking on an event could happen. Um, I don't see it. I just, you know, I think they have too much. But that's my personal. We were talking, 
Okay, so we were up to I, the eligible districts. Oh. I have a question, and this is for the developers, which didn't really get answered, I think, but what was raised. Um, can you address, so it's a side question, how many residents you anticipate the range of number of residents who would be living in the facility can children and teenagers and young adults be living with well what's that? as you might guess it's not a simple answer but <laughs> the um, it's 55 and older so if you have a let's say there's a a spouse that's 56 and a spouse uh, and their spouse is 54 they can live there um, there if they have let's say they have a grown child that's 22 they can't live there so so that that number that was was and, and I understand they were doing a you know a calculation not being familiar with the rules there's no way there's going to be 230 people living <laughs> no way no way um, there is a rule also that this is what we see a lot is let's say you know we're gonna have mostly one bedroom units we have a, a grandparent that's going to be living there uh, and you know uh, a granddaughter comes to live with them for two weeks in the summertime that's allowed you could live up to 14 days and not be on the lease but if you go beyond that, then you, then theoretically, you need to qualify and be on the lease. Now, so, and, and there's an age restriction, so that you can't have your 22-year-old granddaughter living with you in a, on a permanent basis. There is a guardianship uh, rule that is, has just been put in recently where it, more and more grandparents are taking, you know, are, are guardians of their of their grandchildren because the parents are not in the picture or whatever. That's the rule. Now we do not have John. We don't have hardly any of that. We don't have anything like that. We have, you know, a lot of units. St. Mary's. Yeah. Yeah. So while that obviously we have to follow Ohio housing's rules and fair housing and things like that, but we don't. We don't see that often at all. So pretty likely you're going to have most on the one bedrooms, there's going to be a few couples, but not too many, that are going to be living in, in a one bedroom, which, they, which they're allowed to do. And then on the two bedrooms, there, it could, sometimes it's, it's the opposite. If you have a person that qualifies and they want a two bedroom apartment and they're willing to pay the higher, little bit higher rent and they're by themselves, they can do that. So I, there's no real, I, I can't give you a track record that says, okay, there's so many people that are going to live there, but it's not going to be, um, you know, with, I think, was it 42 and 12 do we have? Is that what we have? I think it's 42 and 12. So we have 42 one bedrooms, 12 two bedrooms. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, was, 30, was it? Okay, yeah. we've changed a little bit, so. I don't want to be wrong. Uh, probably somewhere in the 60s, 65 to 70, and and as as I indicated before, probably 40 to 50 percent of the folks will have cars. The folks that are 55 to 65 are more likely, of course, to have cars and working. Uh, the average age of our seniors in in the Dayton units that we have is 78, and that's where you know that obviously draws pushes the percentage down. So it just depends on, you know, what, you know, the, the entry age is 55, but the average age immediately could be 70 or, or, or low 70s. I mean, who knows? We just, we don't know. So hopefully that's, <laughs> I'll try to be vague. I'm just trying to be comprehensive. So, <laughs> okay. Requirements of 125403, and someone had said lot size, lot area, that kind of stuff. 
it meets it. It just comes down to the density and height. Well, I would like to make a statement that um, the existing zoning is RB, and I certainly am um, wanting to increase that to an RC district, regardless of the PUD, but as an underlying district to the PUD, we are giving in to the RC, no matter what. Yeah, that's what the PUD says. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, instead of looking at this and looking at densities and things like that based on what it is presently zoned, which is RB, we are looking at it from an RC density mm -hmm. and then doubling that density, which is above and beyond, way above and beyond a concession for this applicant. Well, as we've noted, in fact, I think, Ted, you were probably the one that noted this. Uh, if in the parallel plan, if there were, what, 14 units, 14 townhouses? And, and each, ha each of them had two or three people in them. You'd come up to that, about the same of dentist density in terms, mm -hmm. of, in terms of people. I'm may add, I think another way to look at it is that the, the density is driven by the infrastructure impact and having uh, so many single bedroom apartments and even the two bedrooms only have one bathroom, the impact on the infrastructure would be similar to a sort of a standard sized home, um, you know, that might have two bathrooms and three people. So not only is it comparable in term to the to the RC density in terms of the number of people also I think when we think about the impact on infrastructure and the and frankly the number of toilets you know so my my statement about density would be that we are um, going to an RC district is not a problem at all and I agree that if you look at the density per unit, and I always talk about fixture units, which is a plumbing connection of some sort, but you know a utility usage calculation, then the 28 units would be of about equal impact to the 54 units that's being proposed. So it's a it's a give that equals out. Yeah, it balances it out. Going to an RC, not from an keeping it as RB. So we're increasing the density on that site no matter what. Oh, what? What's that? Or should should take a little break. Pardon? should take a little break. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if we're moving, so the lot width, area width, is, are we saying that's okay? That's okay. Lot yeah, frontage. Lot frontage. The density is okay. Yep. Let's see. Well, the, the point is that in the context of what Planning Commission's recommendation is, Ted, as I understand what you've said, is there's a, a countervailing consideration to what's contained in the staff report and that, that you would like Planning Commission to consider putting that countervailing consideration into the recommendation that you make. Yes. Okay. Well, the fixtures. Yeah. Height. Yeah. Um, That's the tire. Building exceeds the maximum height of 35 feet, proposed height of 55 feet. Um, I've sat on planning commission, I mean on Board of Zoning Appeal for 15 years, and our attitude about variances, deviations, it's variances in BZA, but we looked at it as kind of like a, an unwritten rule that we can give up 20 percent, you know? I mean, it, is that really going to make that big of a difference? We look at every application individually. Uh, we try to work to figure out how to increase those height area limitations uh, to give homeowners um, 
landowners more flexibility in their designs. And so we have always taken the attitude that we'll variance about 20%. We've never gone above that. And this, I have a real issue going 100%, you know, almost 100% over what is established as our maximum height. You know, albeit, you know, the fire department, I think that, you know, it is a safe building, the fire safety inside that building with sprinkler and fire separation walls and alarms and stairwells and enclosures and means of egress are all taken care of by the building code. Um, so that doesn't concern me at all, but the overall height, given its location, I just think is too tall. I, I just do, so I vote to not allow that height. What, why, what, what is, to, uh, what are the, the negative impacts of that height? like and it's like trying to land a jumbo jet in a small commuter airport you know it just it's in scale and size unlike anything else in the village particularly in a in a neighborhood um it, the scale of it is just massive in and it goes to i think to reinforce the look of warehousing seniors which I just, I oppose that, that image. And then to make that image the most important image that we represent, I think that it's just too large for that site. It's out of context. Well, I don't have a problem with the height. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about this. I went over to Antioch College. I looked at North Hall, South Hall, main building. Um, yeah, it's large. Um, I noticed that we had, I don't know, 20 people, maybe not that many. We had a number of seniors here who's, who want to live there, in there. And none of them seemed to indicate that they felt like they were going to be warehoused. So, you know, that's a negative term um, that you're applying to that. And um, I don't think that, that it's a, warranted. It's, it's, well... Read I'm just saying, you said your piece, I'm saying my piece. Um, yes, it is different, but you know, the fire station being there is different. Friends Care is different. Different and big, uh, big and, and the hotel is different. And you know, uh, so I'm cool with it. Do you want to take a poll on that one? Okay. We'll take a poll on that one. I'm okay with the height. Now. So, are we at minimum yard setback? Which is okay, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Lot setback, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Lot coverage is okay? Lot coverage is fine, lot width, um, um, lot area, yeah, yeah. Um, setbacks are fine. Um, addition, any construction increases? That was just a, that was just a, but you the know. The next concern would be the <coughs> parking requirements. I think you already addressed the parking requirement. Yeah, that was not an issue. Okay. Um, then we're at landscaping. Um, I, yeah, and that that's going to really come with the site plan review process. Um, lighting, I know lighting. they've talked they, about. They did to say that lighting. they're going to, you know, they're they tend to try to keep it. They will not have spillover and glare on neighboring properties in the building. An activity, we've talked about that. Modification of menu. Yeah, see, some of these end up repeating end up themselves. Yeah. Um, so how do we, I mean, we've kind of already voted on some of these things. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think that to the extent that, that we have a record, and again, just keeping in mind that ultimately you're going to get to the big question, which is how do you want your recommend, recommendation to appear so that Judy can create a, a, a record that would reflect what the comments were. 
and where there wasn't consensus and what you want the village council to consider. Um, do we need to go through the review standards in 12406? Um, I think so. So, in the modification of minimum requirements, let me ask this. Um, this Page, page nine. Page nine. Um, so, I feel like we just already answered those. Well, this, we, I think, do think we need to go through modification of minimum requirements because the modification shall also satisfy at least four of the following criteria. Right. And so, number one was preserve the best natural features, which we talked about earlier. Oh, okay. Preserve the concrete is one. <laughs> So, <clears throat> is it um, is it necessary to go through all of them, or just the ones that they apply to it? You need to get the four. We need to get the four. Right. And what I counted up okay. from what your previous is that okay. they, there were two that staff had agreed as a yes on. Two and three. Yeah. Two and three. And then a couple of maybes. Uh, to um, create, improve, or maintain open space for residents, employees, visitors. Staff, staff said that was a yes, and I would agree with that. Does everybody, does everybody else agree with that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Five is the low end. Three, 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 commit at least the, okay, this but is. Let's just stick with two first. Is okay. everybody okay on two? Yes. 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 Okay. Two? Three, okay. at least 10% of the dwellings would be, would be permanently affordable units? Yes. My sense of that, and again, I go back to we advocate for mixed income. Permanently affordable means that this development can never be in a change of ownership or in a change in demographics or in a change to become a mixed income development. It always has to be permanently affordable through this mechanism. And yes. I think that that is. I don't know that that's relevant. I, I, I don't know that's I don't, relevant here I honestly because, don't think because the question is simply commit to at least 10%. You have the other area contemplates whether or not mixed housing is, okay. yeah. but this does not. Right. So there are 20% right. affordable units. So and there is, yes. some, there is something that does go back that states that if this yeah. ever would, whatever we uh, voted on, um, like, as far as like the parking, if it ever converts or somewhere in here, then it, then the required parking would be necessary for that area. Um, so that, that may mean they'd have to take those 54 units and make them into bigger units. Yes, bigger units awesome. in order to in order to meet that requirement. Yeah. Okay, so we're so we're a yes on three. Four. Four. Is provided no. of residential types would be a no. 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 Five. Five. Employ low impact design and um, other best practices. Say no. yes. Yes. I would say yes, mm -hmm. based on what I heard. Six. Employ practices in site layout, building construction materials, result in measurable reduction in energy consumption. Yes. Um, if they build to the allowable density and size, they're going to use less natural resources, less energy, and consume less energy than a proposal that is going to double what is permitted. So no, there is not a reduction in energy consumption compared to an RC district density. Be because of the potential for the deviation based upon okay. yes hmm. we, we don't have, could we just clarify because we don't um, we can't speak to what you said because we don't understand what you said yeah i was going to ask for some okay I'm I'm rephrasing that again as well the the allowable rc district permits you to have a building envelope in size of this you are asking to create this a building of this size consumes so much energy to build it, to maintain it, because that's what it is. If you double it, you're using more, consuming more energy and everything else because you're doubling what you're permitted to do on that site. So I'm saying that 
you know, no, you can't say that it's going to reduce energy when you're doubling what you're permitted to do on the site. Okay, I, I do not think that that is the way that this, uh, I do not think that is the meaning of this phrase. I think the meaning is, is the building that's being built being a low, low energy use building as compared to a standard building? And the answer is yes. It's based on consumption of natural resources. The whole calculation is based on consumption of natural resources, the use of natural resources. So if you're using more natural resource because the building is larger, you are. You're well, it's, it's the number it's of people. But compared to what? Well, I think that you guys can argue to this. Units? I think yeah. you can argue this either way and that you should just call yes. a vote on it. Yeah. There is yeah. not going to be consensus here. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I agree. I think it's you know, the language of it is such that it can be diff, you know, explained in a couple of different ways. I mean, if you go by the number of people living there and per capita energy consumption, it's going to be lower. You know? mm -hmm. but, uh, so I vote yes. 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 No. No. Seven. Excuse me. I, I'm totally confused. Isn't this an R? What's the current zoning? It's R B, but because it's a multifamily in a PUD district, you when you're applying for PUD rezoning, you apply R C standards. Okay, so Thank that's you. what we're going Thanks with. So much. No problem. Now you've just you've you've gotten to the four. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. So then you go to density bonus. Right. Density bonus. Which means you've got to you've got to demonstrate at least three of the following amenities will be included in the development. See where we are, page 11, density bonus. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, oh, three of the following amenities. Number one, more than 20% of the units will be uh, permanently affordable. Yeah. Yes. Yes. If I, if I could note something, that mm -hmm. in the staff report, um, it indicated that the criteria were met, met as to one, eight, and nine. Um, and then okay. you heard uh, information related to cool roof technology that was comparable. And I think that then uh, with the, uh, so that would it argue would apply then, okay. then the LEED certified buildings, there was the alternate cons yeah. the construction. So if you got the yes on those two as well. Yeah. I agree, we can pass on. Okay. And six was there, there were and then, a, then five on the stormwater that will be determined, but then that was discussed in a way that so six low later. impact design is yes because we said that earlier. So are you saying one, two, one, five, two, and five. six or yes is that? Six. Well, actually, I think you can say four too. The green enterprise and then, standards. And then um, so you had eight and nine yeses as well. And you had, or you had eight and nine as yeses. Eight and nine yes. Yes, got it. Okay. And then are we to open space? Mm -hmm. That's already. Those calculations, yeah, yeah those, they, they met those calculations. I explained that earlier. Yes, I explained that earlier. So that is okay with that? Yeah, open space, okay? Yes. Everybody, yes, on open space. I would note that in the open space, there's the specification in 2D where staff had the concern about traffic circulation. That has been addressed, but it's another piece yeah. that has to be considered. And then G and H didn't apply to this. Do we do 54404? I think. I. <coughs> doesn't it doesn't do the general provisions uh, and the review standards are they similar? Well, but you do this first because you gotta prove this before that. I thought we already did 125406. No. No. All right. Well, let's do 125406 then, that which would go on 16. But what I'm saying is in 12.5404 general provisions, like number four, meet the intent and purpose of this code, it's the same in review standards. Well, I, I guess the way I look at it is in 12.5404, which is on page 15, mm -hmm. this, is, this is the area where if there were some 
conditions, some things that you would want council to consider as a condition to this development, this would be the place where you would inject that into the record in your recommendation or whatever it might be. If there is anything, which you may not have identified yet because you're still in this preliminary phase. That's kind of where I'm at. I think, it, you know, we are a preliminary design yeah. review, and at that point, does that not go to council for a preliminary design review? The rest of it will get plugged. Well, they go back to Denise, uh, assuming there's approval, right? Denise, I missed my recollection to go to the admin zoning administrator is the. Um, you mean based on council? Yes, if yeah. council approves, yes. Then. Yeah, if, well, if council approves, and then it just moves on to, they have like a, a year to come back with us right. with a final yeah. plan. Well, But it only goes to planning commission at that final plan. Well, except plan. that if council changes the conditions in, a, in any significant fashion, it has to come back to, right. the, the site back. plan gets modified and it goes back to Denise. So uh, if, for example, planning commission says, we would approve this with the condition that it's three stories instead of four, and council says, nah, four stories is fine, then it triggers a whole other cycle of back and forth. So but it is pretty significant whether you're attaching. Well, well let, me, let me say this. It seems to me that if, if you have heard anything where you think there might be a condition, so let's take something like ADA parking spots, that would be a condition that you would want council to consider. I'm not sure that I've heard anything that, that you would want to go there, but in the context of the discussions that you're having, we have to, to at least talk about that. Is council going to review all of the conditions as we have them, or are they just going to yay or nay it based on a recommendation? I, I think that they would do a thorough review of what you've discussed and look at your report. They can, they have license to do a lot of things yeah. as they review what planning commission's done, but I think that I would expect that council will give some deference to what planning commission's done because this is the public hearing. And um, and so if there were anything that any of you wanted to put in a condition, like all I'm saying is, you know, now's the time for that as part of your recommendation. I mean, to me, as long as we are showing that these deviations are not 100% approved every, you know, blah, 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 but there is in fact discontent or disagreement in some of these things and council sees that and those have been recorded right? yes yeah. then that's where I'm at I think as long as you know there is a voice out there for where that planning commission all isn't all on board with every single one of right. these you guys consider this and come back and say yay or nay that's I'm good with that I th and I think that's what the intention yeah. is yeah. Um, I mean, so that's, Judy's going to write this up? Well, I, I can raise that what, what I think now. I mean, it's going to be up to you as well. But it, because there's a rezoning involved in this, and maybe it would be a good time to find out, because I don't know how time sensitive this is. But the zoning, the code allows Planning Commission 30 days to prepare that recommendation. You have a meeting within that 30-day window. Given the complexity of this recommendation that's going to come out, you may want to say, we'd like to see the draft come back at your next scheduled meeting and review that report to finalize it before it goes to council. Now that may have an impact on the applicant, and if it does, then you know, now would be a good time to hear that. Um, you know, in theory, that could lead to a special meeting. It's, that would be tough. Um, so question, if that, if that is the case, but what does that mean as far as could, okay, so if we have a meeting on, Dece on December 10th, could, in fact, um, we still take it to council on December 17th? Uh, if council wanted to put it on the agenda, I presume that they can. Yes, but then council has to make a decision as to whether they first want to hear the recommendation and then ask for or not ask for a zoning ordinance to come. If they ask for the zoning ordinance to come as a, after they hear and review the recommendation, then that's the first meeting in January. The public hearing for that then is the second meeting in January. That's, council can also say we'd like the ordinance for rezoning brought at our last meeting in December along with your recommendation. They have some options there. Um, 
but I would also say that this is a major, major development and that the time needed for you to do any due diligence required should not be driven by anything other than your need to do due diligence. So uh, there would be two recommendations, one for rezoning and one for this project to move yes. forward? Or not? Yes. With conditions or whatever. Right. Where does the deviation come in? As part of that discussion with council, I mean, that's, and, you know, again, I mean, we, the, the planning conditional commission can only do what it does, which is make that, that approved, right. et cetera. What council does with that information, they have discretion. I, I it, again, I guess, the, what restraints does that create? The application is due February 21st, and it, February 21st. And we have to have the zoning completely site control, which we have, and zoning. We have to have an approved zoning letter or whatever means you do it uh, to be to submitted with the application. Otherwise, it, it, we can't submit. So but that leaves December and January. It, it, it does. So what was the date again? I'm sorry, Wes. Fe I believe it's February 21st. February 21st? Yeah. Is that a Thursday? I might look it up on the Google. <laughs> yes, it is. The concern would just be if council then goes through a long process. Um, it could. <laughs> yeah. That's well, TV. Yes. And yes, that's the, the, the is issue is process. yes, we, on the surface, we appear to have time, but if there's, if we get into it and then there's further yeah, recommendations. And further approvals needed, then it's going to get it. It may get right up against it, um, which you know we're willing. You know we're willing to to roll that roll with it. To you know we we do this not all the time, but you know it cuts it closer to normal. But we're willing to do it. Well, you know I I I would like to see this project happen, and at the same time, most of the projects you've done, I think, have been in bigger locations. Mm -hmm. This is a big project for a little town, so we do need to take the time. It, need. It, I mean, I'm it takes to all forms. We've done it in all different meeting. situations. Well, well as, as a practical matter, I mean, there's going to be time. But I mean, council's going to have more than one meeting on agenda planning. And so, it, and because fortuitously there is going to be one more meeting in between, council could easily decide that they could do a first reading of the rezoning and everything as part of that discussion within their purview. That staff report will give them enough time to set that. I think there's going to be a little gap of time on terms of public notice. Yeah, because the public hearing is the second reading of the zoning code. So I, I think it's manageable and your, and your timeline can be met. Um, yes, it will be close, but I think that you that there will be some signals on how this is being received. Yeah, I, I think I think you're right. That's typically that you know what, what I would, I don't, this is just me, but I would start with the, the normal council meeting that you would have, the, wh whoever's going to give the final approval, which is council, what's their February meeting date? And well, it, has to, it needs to be done, there, it needs to be done in January because it's 30 days, although it, yeah, there yeah, is an I'm emergency saying, process if things really got desperate. Yeah, but, I was oh. say just start there and move, work, I would work backwards. Hold on. <laughs> this is driven by planning commission and council, period. The clearer your recommendation is to council, the more likely they are to say, we are now ready to make an informed decision on this matter. If you rush this end, you jeopardize the other end. I do, I, your time frame is your time frame. I agree with that. I, and, yeah. and I'm That's not willing true. to send anything on the council without us having to see this draft, that draft approved by us, and then that draft be public, it's on record, so that the public can see it before it goes to council. So that, you know, I mean, that puts us... So if the draft of the report is to you on December 10th for that meeting, and, you know, barring not a lot of changes to it, um, 
I mean, the next council meets December 17th. Theoretically, I could come in on Tuesday morning and finalize your changes and get it in the packet for the December 17th meeting. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the play, the, our next meeting is on the 10th? Which is kind of what we yes. already okay. talked about was December 17th anyway. We can, okay. All right. Let's keep okay, so that answers that question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so that there, there will be a draft done for December planning 10th. commission's review. Yeah. And at the meeting on the 10th with its recommendations that will go to council. Yeah. And then council can deal with the anticipation of that event on their agenda planning for the 17th. Yeah. So my suggestion would be that on the 10th then, you go through the review standards, that you just hold that to that time. There's, you don't have to do it right now. <clears throat> and then dur during that meeting, that is where you, you know, continue to finish crafting that document. And the review standards, you simply, you have to go through them as a matter of course. It's a legal matter. You want to be on record as having gone through every single one of them, but I don't know that it affects the draft in terms of what you're recommending. Is, am I right in that assessment, Denise? Yeah. Okay. I mean, because I've already gone through it. It's just, they're just, yeah. yeah. They're basically um, confirming that what, what they said in this meeting was in my report. Right. Yeah. I can live with that. So I, I think now you would need to put together, do you think you want a, a motion that embodies what the recommendation is? Uh, mm, I think you move to, uh, to ask staff to prepare yes, that's a right. report do that. without, yeah. Yes, without, without, any, ask, yes, without. Ask staff to prepare a report for review and, and, uh, and approval at the December 10th meeting. So moved. Second. Who so moved? I'm sorry. Ted. You moved. Oh, you moved. You second. second. Okay. We all second. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't second. Okay. Good. Okay. Call the roll. Yep. Let's do it. Oh, you can do it all in favor. All in favor. Aye. Opposed? I don't think so, okay. because I think that they can do that. Just to get that okay. I seem to have. <laughs> they did. <clears throat> so, Denise, if you just quickly say what's on the docket else otherwise for the, mm -hmm. the 10th, You've also got the infrastructure report with Johnny Burns coming Um well, Yeah, I'm going to scratch that. Okay. Yeah, uh, because December 10th also on the docket is a, there's going to be a conditional use hearing um, for a professional office um, for massage therapy in a, in a home occupation, basically, uh, house. There's also the possibility that there's going to be um, the owner of the 314 Dayton Street property. I'm meeting with him tomorrow. Um, this property, the old Union Schoolhouse, has a, uh, those covenants on them, and he really wants to, he's, we've been back and forth on what he thinks he can do. Um, I, I'm, I'm at a point where I just said, you really maybe need to come with your little, with your concept. Nothing, this wouldn't be a public hearing yet. He'd have to obviously come back for a public hearing when he has something set. But right now, he's just asking, what are my parameters? Um, for what I could do based on these covenants and I said if you just bring that um, with a little vision of what you're wanting to do then at least Planning Commission can review the, the, the covenants or the restrict, restricted easement that's recorded on that property um, against what he's want his vision and see kind of give him some direction you on what he might do. Well, well I, I, I guess I have a concern with that hmm. because he, what he's saying is he's asking the Planning Commission to interpret the covenants and restrictions without more behind it. I mean, he needs to come here, in my opinion, with a plan of, to say what he wants to well, do. Well, it's a site plan is what he's going to come with. Okay. Yeah, because before, it, I mean, it was like, can I do this, can I not do that? And that's not what I wasn't comfortable with. 
I didn't want to say, yes, you can do that, but no, you can't do this. So I told him to come with a site plan. Uh, well, my suggestion would be is let's leave that at the staff level and then we'll <laughs> deal with that at staff before it becomes an agenda item for the Planning Commission because uh, I think. Do we have the authority to vacate those restrictions? That, that's, that's a whole, that's a whole other issue that's and planning, planning Commission wouldn't have the right. authority. Right. That, would, that would require uh, some type of legal just, action. The, I just mean yeah. the, the village. Just yeah, I don't. I, that's well, who question. holds it? Yeah, and, I, and I've got it sitting on my desk. I looked at it months ago, and I can't tell you that. But I, I remember my recollection was it would be. An, it was usually a judge. It was the council that put the right, and then, then the council put the restrictions right. on it, and then sold it. It would be a significant right. issue. But I think a judge can vacate. Yeah. Well, they, there, yes, there's a process by which it can be done, but it wouldn't be simple. And uh, <laughs> we entertain a motion that we forego old business, new business, and have a motion. Well, you don't want to keep here. You don't want to keep staying here till 11. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.